Well, hello, hello. Uh, welcome to another Wednesday night toy talk with yours truly and uh, a very special guest. And tonight, my guest is, I mean, he doesn't need any introduction, right? It's none other than uh, Mr. Michael French from Retro Blasting. Hey, Chad. How's it going, man? <laughs> Good. How you doing, sir? Good. I can't complain. I can't complain. Awesome. I awesome, did all awesome. my complaining for the past 10 years, so I'm I'm, I'm good now. <laughs> so you're good? You got it all out? For the out? most part, until a company does something stupid again. But yeah, I'm good. Yeah. So you know uh, I love your I love your room behind you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's it, you know, nice. it's a garage, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the missus and I, we go where the military says to go. And, uh, you know, you, you met my wife. And oh, it, yeah. We just we just go where the military says. So if the house isn't big enough, toys take over the garage. I, hey, that we we bought a house because we knew we were going to need a space to finish out to put the toys. And yeah, yeah. Like, and um, one one day we'll get there. But for right now, we just do what Uncle Sam tells us to do. So absolutely, absolutely. We just make do. Um, at least you have a space. Yes, yes, I I do have a space. The cars are outside, and I have to rent a gigantic um. You know, like a like a, a rental space unit. Yep. You know, but uh, that's okay because my toys have a home and <laughs> it's my my special place. So I I want to come back around to what we were just talking about. We got we got a bunch oh. of people with us already in the chat, which is awesome. And right off the bat, chronically online uh, sends a super chat of five dollars. Thanks, buddy. And he says, "Hey, fellas, been looking forward to this all day. By the way, today's laundry day, so Commander Chronic is now known as Commando Chronic." You're welcome. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> so, complaining. Yeah, it's kind of kind of a kind of a broad umbrella, and um, <laughs> which we're, we're just going to get into it right off the bat. Okay. I think you and I see eye to eye on this stuff, where you know, if you're passionate about something and you speak up about it, a lot of times you get labeled as what hater uh, yeah jinx hater <laughs> why do you think that is uh, there's been this phenomenon um it, it's not it's not just limited to the toy community but it's particular particularly acute in our community um where you can say positive stuff as much as you want about a thing but the moment somebody says something critical or observes something that's genuinely flawed about a product or a service or a piece of art or whatever it is, immediately everybody's like, shh, just let people enjoy things. <laughs> yeah. And I, I've actually had to push back on this and say, you know, my enjoyment of a film or of a toy or of uh, a business strategy or something like that, my enjoyment of it is directly related to how logical and or um, uh, how much how much it makes sense. In other words, like how much of this makes sense both for the customer, both for the storyline, both for the motivations of the characters or the audience that you have, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's right. the, the Rubik's Cube's a little different for each thing, whether it's toys or whatever. But the overriding the overriding factor is still the same. In other words, you, you, Mr. Positivity, not you, the Mr. Positivity guy. Yeah, that's not me. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Positivity never seems to take into account that people enjoy things in different ways. So um, if I, uh, unlike Mr. Positivity, am good at details, which he is not, um, if I uh, have to find a way to enjoy something that otherwise is not... Uh, appealing to me uh, or is irritating me, then my outlet for that is to disseminate all of the problems with it or point out, hey, this toy company um, has designated itself in the same category as a company that makes mouthwash. Do we not find this interesting and strange? Right. I don't see that as being negative. I see that as being investigative, being observant. Um, I don't, I, but yes, you're correct in, in that there seems to be a double standard. Gush about a movie or a toy all you want before it's out. There's no amount of love that you can prematurely lavish on something. Right. Rise of Skywalker. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Last Jedi. <laughs> like, like all of them. But 
by God, if you if you speculate that something could be bad or if you've seen it and think it's bad after it's already been released or after you have it in your hand, you need to be quiet and just let everyone enjoy their joy. Right. Don't right. don't yuck my yums as these people like to say. Yeah. You're the joy like, killer. Yeah, and it and it's like, wow, well, you kill my joy all the time. Why 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 do you get to step on my joy? Like right. Oh, my joy's invalid. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. Right. Good good luck with your, you know, glued together made out of like sawdust predator figure. Go go right ahead, you know, whatever. Yeah. 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 Just yeah. yeah. I I'm I'm sorry I pointed out that that neck of predator fell apart when I breathed on it. Right. Oh, oh that did you just got a bad batch. It's like <laughs> oh, you didn't. Yeah. And and look, I'm really glad. Like I'm genuinely glad that all the reports have been coming in for the last 18 months, I guess that NECA's really up their game. I mean, that's great. That's, that is really encouraging to hear from people like yourself and, and me. Like there's other people like you and I, who I trust to be objective. And when they tell right. me, Oh yeah, NECA's not having as many problems as they used to. It's like, that's really good to hear. I'm really glad to hear that. You know, cool. like I don't want, I don't want a company to suck forever. Like, no, I, you no. know, that's not why I make videos, you know? And that's, you know, that's the Hasbro dilemma mm -hmm. in a nutshell. Exactly what you just said. Like, I don't I don't want Hasbro to be frustrating or leave money on the table. I don't want them to tell, you know, fans of four decades of a scale like, well, we're done with you. You know, I, right. I don't want them to do that. And at the same time, I don't want to be like, I don't really want to say disgruntled, but I don't want to be like irritated or fed up with them. It's it's like that, you know, that dysfunctional um intimate relationship where you like oh if if they would only be like this they would be the best you know boyfriend or girlfriend ever it's like they're not going to be like that <laughs> you know <laughs> move along <laughs> just do something else but right yeah that they, they keep waiting for and, and i think i think that's where they have these lofty almost childish aspirational fantasies toward these these companies and yeah i think articulated ninja said it really well in his video that came out i can't remember if it was today or yesterday time is starting to blur but um he said something really really astute and and just it really hit me where you know these there's a there's a contingent of our community that comes at everything from be nice to the company think about what the company needs Think about what the what's in the company's best interests. Yeah, they, and it's they've like, got it rough. Yeah. It's like, when did that become our starting point? Like, yeah. like when when did we suddenly, as the people on the consumer side, and I, I, I firmly believe it has a lot to do with the rise of social media influencers, where yeah. suddenly people started to feel like they were friends with these companies. And I've I've pointed out in videos before, it's like, these companies aren't your friends. As a matter of fact, they're not even friends to each other in the companies. Like, like the person that you thought was the friendly face of that company has gone because they got let go with in the layoff of 2016 or whatever. Now there's some new Joe Blow yep. that, that's standing there. So like there is this group of people that the beginning of their argument about um, say uh, a predatory move from Hasbro or kind of a cheap layup from a toy company. They always start with, well, you got to understand the challenges that the company is facing. You know, these companies, they, and it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Hold on. We're, we're boots on the ground. All right. Like yeah. we're the end we're, user. Yeah. When, end user. Thank you. Like when, when did you step across the picket line and become a scab? For yeah. you know the the company man like like yeah. it's weird and I'm not saying that that means that we should always be adversarial to the company when a company does something good like when they make a great figure or they make a great product absolutely let everybody know like don't yeah. don't sit there and do the opposite uh, side of the problem where it doesn't matter what good they do I'm always gonna hate them it's like that's not helpful either like no but. No. But when they when they screw up, as these mega corporations do often, because sure. they have no soul, um, you you have to call that out. And if you're standing there just kind of like being all THX eleven thirty eight, you know, trying to hit that feeder bar to get those sedatives so that you can still feel good 
yeah. about your interaction with those faceless goons on the on the live streams and stuff. Well, the, I, I feel like you're coming at it from the wrong place. I don't think you're ever going to see. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think you're doing yourself any favors by doing that. Is you know. Yeah. For, yeah. for everyone hanging out with us in the chat, and that you know, there's a lot of you, and I'm I'm watching you guys come in and say hi, but you know, I'm I'm listening to Michael and I'm focusing on him. You need to appreciate the fact that Michael has amazing eye contact. So he's looking right in the camera as he's speaking, but because I'm I'm multitasking on numerous screens, I don't know where I'm looking. I think I'm looking like this. But I'm looking in his eyes, so I don't know where I'm looking, but it's, Okay, uh... well, well, I have a I have a dumb I have a really dumb funny story about that. So, uh I can't remember what stream it was that I was on, but somebody had a uh, real, it was a real great stream, real, real nice. I, I, I didn't remember having a bad time, um, but they made mention of the fact that I was um, making eye contact or whatever. No, no, that's what it was. I had to say that I was making eye contact because they said, Hey, a few minutes ago, you know, when I did the thing or whatever, when I showed the thing and I went, I didn't see that. And he was like, what? And I went, I'm looking at my camera. Yeah. So that, cause I've trained myself to always, because I know, I trained myself early on when we started doing all this live streaming stuff across YouTube. It was like, well, the audience who's watching, they're the ones seeing us all the time for the majority of the stream. Right. So I need to always look engaged as a guest. Like I need to always be engaged. But what that does is I lose like 30% of the experience right. because like, so now what I've had to do is retrain myself to take note of, when the host brings something physically up into camera, I need to look real quick and then, you know, look back so that I'm aware. Cause I got caught proverbially with my pants down. I was like, I did not see what you just did a few minutes ago. I've been trying right. to maintain this illusion. Yeah. Very smart. Mm -hmm. um, I got a couple of comments that I mm -hmm. starred while we were having that discussion. Sure. So, um, First is uh, Big Bacon, and he says, Matt Damon, speaking of crappy figures. And uh, Ted Darklaw is here. What's up? And Ted says, I've been waiting for this all week. <laughs> Me too, man. <laughs> I've been waiting for this for a while. This is awesome. Thank you very much, Ted. Appreciate it. And uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I made a car rant about hella dope toys, and that's going to go up tomorrow. I love your car rants. They are some of the... When a, when a car rant comes up, it always seems to land at the perfect time where I'm like in the middle of, oh, I'm right, I'm over here editing something and I've been at it for like five hours or whatever since like the crack of dawn. And right. suddenly you have a car rant come up and I'm like, oh, thank God I can take a break and just watch, you know, Chad in a car rant. Thank God. Yeah. Yelling in his car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. I really do. Yeah. Uh, Media Clash says, in what other part of consumer society do we just go, oh, well, Bad Batch? Imagine if we allowed the auto industry to do that. Um, Ford Pinto? You, you see, that's the funny part, though. I've, I've run into uh, the, the car analogy and other aspects of toy collecting. And just like in this case, like Media Clash has made a great point here. Yeah. It seems like the people on the other side of, the, of these toy arguments, they always try to use classic car analogies incorrectly like like in other words media class has just made this great point that they they would have a double standard about a car not being right right i've actually had like hardcore vintage collectors try and say that well you know it's like having a classic car you wouldn't change any of the parts out for reproduction and i'm like yeah you would Absolutely. Like, <laughs> yes, you would. Some of those parts are meant to be changed, or else you die in a big ball of fire. Like, um, it, yeah, yeah. You, you talk about your DeLorean and what the fuel pump all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, speaking of which, uh, Jim Largo from Largo's Lair says Chad has found the magic formula. Michael needs to do a cathartic car rent from the DeLorean. Every time I do one, though, they'll be like, "Why is he always in the garage?" <laughs> Why not? Because it's like, because my car ain't moving right now. Yeah. Uh, Patrick says, pointing out the suck gives companies the chance to make it better. Whether they capitalize on that is on them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 100%. Great. Yeah. 100%. And then, uh, since it's my show and I can say it, and, um, and Vargo says, fuck them companies. <laughs> <laughs> Just Jeff, thanks for the $5 super chat, buddy. He says, I once saw Michael French wrestle a bear while it's covered in honey and only wearing a fig leaf. Enjoy some Slurpees. <laughs> Or actually some beers. 
Wow. Appreciate that. I, I must have been so blitzed out on old Overholt that I don't even remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I've heard the stories. Look, <laughs> man, I even put your logo up there next to your head. I know. I was seeing that. This is like super classy. I feel like I'm in one of those first class seats in those modern airplanes where you get your own like bubble. Like, yeah, except great. for my dumb ass, right? Because it's all muscle memory. When I first started the show, you know, and I'm clicking everything behind the scenes. I was like, yay. <laughs> and then we, it was like, damn it. I got to get rid of that. You can't have that there. Um, JLS, um, great YouTube channel, says it's up to us as consumers to keep companies in check, whether we speak up or speak with our wallets. Yep. Always. It, yep. It is a dual, it is a dual, or uh, sorry, it's a two pronged approach. Yep. You got to speak up and you got to, you got to close your wallet to that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, I, I, I won't name names because it's not relevant to this and I don't want to throw, you know, like shade at anybody, but I think that, I think JLS has walked us into a, a little mention here. Um, I had someone reach out to me a few months ago asking if I would contribute a video clip um, to a live stream they were going to do where they wanted to talk about the um, the good and bad of toy industry crowdfunding from the big companies like Mattel and, and Hasbro. Love that topic. Right. I, I do too. However, yeah. um, they told me, uh, they said that they were going to be also asking um, somebody else that, you know, whose opinions on it, I felt were already very much out there and, and very um, tone deaf and kind of biased. And, and I said, look, I said, first of all, I said, I, I don't really want to have video clips alongside this other, you know, entity. Right. And I said, but on top of that, I said, I really feel like this conversation is like, it's like, it's like debating uh nuclear weapons after you've already dropped the atomic bomb it's like we should have had this conversation before yeah um and and i said and you guys this is what i said to him i said you guys as far as the crowdfunding thing goes you guys already opened pandora's box it's out there i said i wanted to have this conversation uh back in 2018 and you guys didn't want to listen i was to saying to him you guys not you yeah you guys you guys didn't want to listen at the time and now you've opened the the barn door and the horse has escaped that's it and now you're asking you know me to have a conversation with you about the merits of barn doors and it's like i'm <laughs> i'm sorry but um you're late to this party and now this conversation has a lot less value right and um yeah so anyway sorry to just made me think of it no, yeah, absolutely good point. And then uh, Big Bacon says, I literally trashed a crap figure. It was great. So he was reviewing that retro Walmart Duke, you know, the the, 50th yeah. kind of re the screaming face one. Right, the right. The worst Duke you can put back out. And he opened it and he was talking. And he goes, you know what? And he just chucked <laughs> it in the trash. <laughs> It was great. It was a great video. I got into so much trouble years ago on the channel, very, very early days for doing that because I found one of those ID four aliens in like, Oh a yeah. Box. Yeah. And, um, I was like, ah, oh. and I said, this thing was, oh. and it was complete and everything. And my buddy Joe and I just did a quick video where we just threw it in the trash because it was such a terrible toy. Yeah. And, um, people like this guy in Ireland, like jumped me for it. He was like, he was like, why'd you throw that in the trash? Could have sent it to me. You know what I'm like? Well, I'll dig it out. Give me your address. I'll send it to you never gave me his address i'm like oh, okay yeah 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 that's that's uh complaining to complain right oh exactly yeah yeah and then uh matt rubin sends a five dollar super chat thanks matt says uh i guess this is to you michael how do you decide where to draw the line when talking about what they are doing wrong do you even think there is a line like that at all um that you know, Matt, that's a really interesting uh question, and I don't mean that in the politician way where when you say it's interesting, you don't have an answer. Yeah, I actually have an answer. <laughs> yeah, I have an answer for you because one of the phrases that I get a lot um when I'm in the middle of an issue like with the Haslab Rancor or the sale barge, excuse me, RC makes you belch. Yeah, um, they um they love to say things like well, I think, I think you're being a little harsh. And I, I did this video a few years ago called to be fair, where I was yes, talking to be about, fair. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, they love to start with things like to be fair, or you can always notice the different to be fair, or, you know, and then they love to push back on people with, I think you're being a little harsh. I think you were, 
you you were kind of harsh there. And it's like, it's like this is a this this is a vintage battle cat. Okay, it is an inanimate object. It is plastic. It does not move. All right, there's no articulation points. It is a wonderful little bit of nostalgia, but it has object objective ob observable limitations. All right. Yeah. It is not harsh. You cannot be too harsh on a toy. Like this toy does not require shelter, food. It does not require care. It, it is not a child. Like no. you, you, it has no psych. It has no psyche. You cannot traumatize this object. No. Like there's nothing you can do that would imply harshness uh, will affect it. And and that's kind of my point with these companies as well that make these products is that these products. And the people behind them who put their necks out uh, about them and want your money, the moment they're saying, I want your money for this thing. Now, if now when you've given over that money for that, for that, um, that, I guess, uh, promise, it's sort of like a, an, an illicit promise of we will now deliver this experience for you. Right. Um, that's what they do with marketing. Right. They they are now on the chopping block as far as harshness and fairness. There's no there's no sense at this point um, in being fair about that product because it doesn't matter how, as Bobby Valla would say, hard in the paint you go in on that product. Or like if I wanted to just rip this Battle Cat toy a new one in a video, there's, there's not going to be a victim on the other end. The yeah. only people who are victims are the ones who make themselves emotional victims because they believe that like battle cats saved their life when they were five or something. And, and that, you know what, it's a great memory to have. It's not, it didn't actually happen that way, but, but great, you know, whatever. But th the point I'm trying to make is that I don't think there is a line um, barring, obviously I know you're not going there, Matt, but I'll just say this outright. So everybody knows I have never, you know, said that uh you know hasbro should be burned down i've never said that we should you know get you know poster boards and, and yardsticks and make signs and like protest i've never said anything like that that's going too far that's being ridiculous but using your voice on the internet uh in a constructive in a constructive way even if it's harsh I don't believe there's a limit on harshness and fairness when it comes to that, as long as you're not harming people. Like if you're if you're sticking to the topic, I, I feel like you should be able to express yourself any way, any way you like, it, it, especially if you've parted with your money or they're asking you to part with your money. Right. Um, maybe I just sounded like a crazy person. I may have just pushed the audience away from me, but um, <laughs> no. I really I really don't think that there's. I think it gets dangerous when we start it, it, that gets back to the whole thing of people who think companies are our friends. Yeah. Well, so, so like, for example, Matt, like Chad is a friend of mine. I've met him in person. I, I, I know Chad, like, yep. and there are, there are lines that I won't cross in engaging Chad just out of decorum manners and just a general sense of camaraderie. He's another person. We have a relationship. Like, that's that's a thing mutual respect um chad has not you know asked me for 250 dollars in cash or a crappy bantha like not yet nothing, no <laughs> right there's nothing like that going on so but once that once that transactional relationship flips over and takes place yeah. in, a, in a scenario then suddenly you shouldn't be so squeamish as to assert yourself i yeah. think that's the thing it's like yeah because yeah. you're holding the bag yeah, exactly. You're now on the back foot and they have your money and, you know, hey, I will be heard, you know? Yeah. Oh, that Bantha thing was rough. Oh. That thing was rough. Uh, just Jeff, uh, $5 super chat. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, says, like Ghost Rider, Michael has a stare power. It won't make you relive your sins, but you'll soon wonder what galaxies he's trying <laughs> to import you to. <laughs> Very nice. Thanks, man. And then Curb Stomp says, my first super chat ever appreciate that man for the five dollar first ever the virginized super chat it's crazy as a retail worker and a collector it is man it's it it's 
let me let me get to this last one and then i want to kind of come back to what curb stomp was saying so uh okay. world made of cardboard thanks buddy uh for a five dollar ship chat says criticism is essential for growth whether you are a person or a company properly analyzing the criticism against you can help you become better yeah, yeah. but mm -hmm. you have to be open to it right? yes you have and you also have to know where that distance is you know you have to put yourself outside of it's like this this is not part of my personality. This is not who I am as a person. You can walk up to me tomorrow, I, and I know because people have, and they've been like, I hate Empire Strikes Back. I think it's the worst Star Wars movie. I'm not saying that is a wizened or even common opinion, but I've heard it. And you know what? I don't hate the person for it. Do I yeah. pity them their movie taste? Yeah. But do I like think that they're like you know a, a horrible person and I need to yell at them or get worked up about it? No, like, yeah. I don't think, I don't think that I never look at them and say, I think you're being too harsh on the empire strikes back. It's to like, be fair. yeah, like, <laughs> you know, really? Like, yeah, it, it's yeah. crazy. Um, yeah. So thanks for that world made of cardboard. Appreciate it. And then I kind of want to come back to this. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think is going on? And, you put videos out about it. I have. I did a car mm -hmm. rant about it yesterday because of uh, Re uh, Revenge of the Nerd. And what is going on with the boys' action toy industry? And, and I say it like that because you don't really see it with Lego. You don't see it mm -hmm. with baby dolls. You don't really see it with Barbie. You don't see it with some of the and, – and I've had somebody already say, well, actually, uh, it's happening to Barbie too. Thank you. And I'm like, get out of here, man. Barbie has a whole freaking aisle. Action figures, it's like half an aisle now. Right. What's what's going on with in your in your opinion, in your observations, what's going on with the toy industry? Like their marketing and distribution. And I mean, we know that they they've already priced kids out of toys, but yeah. what do you think is going on? Uh I I've talked about this a lot uh in various videos that I cannot possibly cite anymore because i can't you ever had to go back and watch your own video to do homework i've done that before now like it's crazy i've like i couldn't remember something about wheeled warriors one time i was like i need to go i'm gonna have to go back and watch my own video to remember what that was it's kind of a surreal moment but anyway um i've talked about this a lot in in certain videos where it's a chicken and the egg problem so like let's let's take ourselves away from the toy thing for a minute to illustrate it with with a, a parallel Movie studios love to say that people aren't buying physical media anymore. Mm. Yeah. The problem with that argument is that they started to abandon physical media rapidly in order to mount streaming services. Disney specifically. Disney specifically. Yeah. They started to take the opportunity of choice away from us. And by extension... Uh, as more and more people found that the content they wanted was only on streaming or that was what they were pushing because they were doing the thing where we're going to put it out on streaming uh, and video on demand like three months before you ever get a disc. They were yep. laying the groundwork to make people buy into that faster to get to wean them off of even thinking about discs. But then they turn around and they say, oh, well, people weren't buying them anymore. It's like, um you stopped making them, you deprioritized them, and then you turned around and told your retail partners, yeah, it's cool if you don't carry them anymore. We don't we don't need them. And now you're you're going to sit there and have the audacity to say, "Oh no, it was cuz you guys weren't buying them." Um you guys are guiding the market. Your hand is on the rudder, my friend. Like you're the one. So I think with toys it came down to uh and I've said this many times. I even got into an argument with a, you know, self-described, you know, former toy executive on a debate about it um oh, what, what, oh what, i wonder i wonder who that was <laughs> um but the the only reason i'm not even saying the names because i just don't want them to get any promotion um yeah, we all know we know yeah, but uh i said it i said during that, that that stream as well i said you know i've been going into toy aisles every week of my life since i was what driving age like i mean and even before that you know like yeah. sporadically and I have seen like what you've seen, the di distribution get worse, the volumes get smaller, the, the hunt get harder, yeah. all that kind of stuff. I think the mistake that the toy companies made, the big ones especially, Playmates not so much. Playmates has kind of stayed true to their vision and other companies that have come along like 
jazz wares and jack specific kind of get it but they're yeah. not their market mobile yeah Playmobil definitely their market share though is not as big but um has where uh, has where hasbro and mattel they kind of did what um what some of the uh what the comic book industry did in the uh, 90s where they got stuck on the one generation that was buying their stuff and instead of remembering that they had to court the next generation of kids they just followed that that generation in the money train up yep. through the decades yeah and in doing so as more and more people became adult and and lost interest naturally in toys and bled off just like with comics but when they looked back and realized what they had evolved their products into for comics, it was far more adult, higher um, uh, cover price, everything like that. The, 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 the books were inaccessible to children at that point. Toys, it was higher price per. And then like kids, they had not even been marketing to them. So suddenly they were like, oh, kids aren't buying toys anymore. Must be the video games. And I'm sitting there going, you yeah. know what? I grew up in the 80s and 90s when video games were huge, like in the home, huge. Nintendo, Sega, you know, PlayStation, all that stuff was massive. Like it was yep. huge. And yet toys were doing just fine. Like toys were a complement to that. And there was no shortage of no. interest in either in either direction. These guys are making excuses because they just didn't bother to properly market to kids for an entire generation and a half. And now they're looking back and they're like, oh, uh, it's because kids just don't buy the toys anymore. And it's like, I'm not going to say that that's not a percentage of the problem because of technology, especially with mobile devices. But you guys have a large part to play in why they ran so completely to those devices. Yes. You guys weren't giving them anything. You weren't you weren't stepping up and, and, no. and giving your A game to this. And now, now it's like, well, we just we just cater to adults now when i did that when i did that uh, discussion that that friendly debate um that was challenged i i said you know it's the the toy industry is focusing more and more on adults and this guy was like no and i'm like are are, are they not though like and and then that article came out a few months later the articles always come out like a few months after i've said my it's 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 so frustrating yeah but, um, the article came out. I can't remember if it was Fortune. Uh, I did. I think I did a video on it. So a lot of channels did videos about that article where they the, talked the about Kidults article. The, the Kidults article where they talked yeah. about how the toy industry is definitely shifting hard and fast to its a vast percentage of its sales are targeting adults. And I said it. I said years before that when the crowdfunding thing happened. Ugh. I said you don't crowdfund to kids on an online portal with toys that are hundreds of dollars each nope. that shows and proves that the big toy companies are going toward adults. And at the time, this guy and other people were like, no. And now it's like, Oh, well maybe there was something to that. And I'm, and that's when I get back to the whole thing about why are you guys so bad at details? Like I, I wouldn't want to be in a rifle squad with you guys. Like I, I, I would want to go get transferred somewhere else. Like, yeah, I'd be like, Whoops. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't want to be in a I wouldn't want to be in a fighter group with you guys. Like, no, like no. you guys would not be watching my six. You wouldn't be watching your own six. Like you you probably fly into me. Like I would not want yeah. anything to do with you guys. And and that's that's the situation. So. Yeah, and, and that's the thing that I don't get, you know, just, just trying to understand the why of things and ask the why. I'm real big on whys, you know, mm -hmm. why this, why that? Yeah. Like what's what's the motivation? What's the What's the why of it? And it, you see, they over years have been pricing kids out of toys. They they don't give kids media anymore. I mean, Marvel Legends, yeah, you got the MCU, but that's a dumpster fire now. So right. Star Wars, and um, you know, the only thing that's really keeping Star Wars limping along is original trilogy figures. Like here's another Jedi Luke, and yep. for a minute it was you know Grogu, Baby Yoda, the Mandalorian, and now that's gone to pot too. And <laughs> they didn't even get those out in time. No, no. Those came out um, too late. <laughs> yep, they did. Yeah. And it's just kind of one of those things I I don't I don't agree with it. I don't understand it. Like, well, well we're going to price kids out of toys. We're only going for the deep pocket adult collectors. And then there's the ones like me and I I'm, I'm not saying I'm the majority, right? But I I don't believe I'm 
people like me are that much in the minority either where you you basically just you sent me to your independent mm -hmm. competitors because you're like we don't we don't care for your business anymore because we're we're following this uh trend or whatever yeah. it is and yeah i mean why why am i always waiting for the next stan solo figure release right it's because he does the work to the quality level that i really respect and appreciate whereas you know hasbro is not and people no. have you know challenged me by saying i'm not paying you know 30 dollars for a loose action figure and five poa and i'm like i will definitely pay that when i know that it is of a grade detail quality and sculpting and it will fit right into my collection whereas the retro hasbro stuff which continues to go up in price with every wave is still subpar to what we were getting back when we were kids you know yeah. like it's all a matter of some people I think look at the number of what the the price is and they say well it's still the lowest price even though they've raised it. It's like yeah, but you're also still getting garbage. So yeah. you know it, that's that whole argument about price and value and you, mm -hmm. you know I'm not going to argue intrinsic value with somebody about something but Tim Hayes says uh Cara Dune was the best thing about Mandalorian. I like her, but <laughs> I've got it, the, yeah. I've got the Black Series figure still in the box. So do I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As soon as they canned her, I was like, watch this. And I, went and I scooped up a bunch and I, so, I put them in a case and that's where they're sitting. In fact, I think the only Cara Dune figure I don't have from the, the mainline Hasbro stuff is the vintage collection one. The three and three quarter inch hyper articulated. Yeah. I've got the retro and I've got the, the black series. Anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. I've, I've got that. Um, yeah. The, the vintage collection with the carbonized. Yep. Oh, I don't have that one. That's an, but that, that to me that was a variant of black, yeah, black series. So yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Um, I start a couple others. So uh, Patrick says one of our major regional retailers have essentially cut Hasbro products. One peg of Legends, a small handful of Black Series. That's it. There's no pegs for uh, classified in any of the WalMarts where I live. No. Well, and the weird thing is, go ahead. Sorry, it's all right. The weird thing is. I'm not going to buy them, right? Mm -hmm. But I love toys. I love being right. in the toy community. I still go down the aisles, just like you were saying. It's mm -hmm. it's one of those things. It's like muscle memory. It's ingrained in us. We yep. still go down the toy aisles. What's going on? How's it look? Like, what's the health of this aisle look like? It looks like a freaking Soviet grocery store is what it looks like. Yep. But then you see people posting all this shit from Ollie's, and it's like cases oh. and cases. Oh, yeah. Of figures that never made it to Walmart nope. or Target or Walgreens, and it's like, they went immediately to Ollie's for four ninety nine, mm -hmm. and and I'm like, don't tell me distribution's not broken. You can't say it's not broken. Remember that shit with that, um, the the faces of evil, yes, the Eldor pack, yes. and there was the shit with Major Blood and the Baroness and that that stuff. Like, I Dude, don't I don't understand it. When Rogue One was out, okay, so yeah. so my my buddy who's a he's a big modern star wars collector he's been in the game since like and he's been collecting everything he's like a star wars toy guy yeah and um in 2011 he started telling me about how that he had for the first time he had to go buy a case of figures directly from hasbro's like web i remember page. you telling this yeah yeah and um and it was for the the vintage collection bespin han had finally come out in that wave and nobody could find it anywhere unless they just bought it directly from the distributor, right? So they had to start doing this stuff. Well, 2015, uh, 2016, Rogue One comes out and I was buying the, the figures and uh, keeping up with the waves and I was getting them in store. Like I wasn't buying them online. I was going into the store yeah. like Target, Walmart. And I was finding them, right? Brick and mortar. And, yeah, exactly. And um, and then uh, the, the wave that came out with the Admiral guy that was like Akbar, but he was green and the sort of overweight. Radis, Admiral Radis. Yeah, yeah. and the, the sort of Churchill. overweight Rebel Commando guy. I can't remember yeah. his name. That, that wave, I never saw that wave in stores ever. No matter how many times I checked, I never saw it. And then I heard from, I can't remember if it was, it was either at Toy Fair or um, Comic-Con or one of those events. Somebody... Uh, posted on one of the Star Wars like Rebel Scum boards or something that he had spoken to the Hasbro rep uh, at the event at their booth and asked about that wave. And they told him point blank, they said, look, 
if you can get it like from like an eBay scalper, grab it now because we don't even know where they're ending up. Yeah. And it's like, and that was my first inkling. And then and then I I I was living, I'm I'm living in the Atlanta area. So the Atlanta area never saw the Black Series figures for Chirrut and Baze Malbus. We never saw them until they ended up like nine months later flooding Tuesday mornings. Like that that was where they ended up was Tuesday morning shop. Which is like um, another Ollie's, right? Yeah, it's another yeah. Ollie's, yeah. yeah. And it, we were like, what the hell? Like what's going on? And yet every time I would bring up these examples, people would be like, distribution's not broken you just gotta get you know you gotta get more savvy on the hunt man and i'm you like you gotta get good yeah get good, <laughs> get good. i'm like what th look this you guys act like that them making the distribution more messed up is like some game that you get good at and i'm like there's there is no there's no accolade there's no um extra cheese on your taco for okay. beating a video game at extra difficult. Nobody cares that you did it. Like nobody no. cares that you beat something on very, very hard. All right. No, I beat them on easy and I enjoy the process. Exactly. Thank you. So, so like if I have to pay five bucks extra to a scalper for a thing that I really want, then I'll do it. Like when those, um, when the uh, retro carded Baroness and Lady J came out for classified that are now flooding Walmarts. Yeah. At the time you didn't know how many they were going to be making. Yep. Um, I, I went out and I was like, you know what? I really want those two figures. I'm just going to grab them from this guy that had them both for sale as a duo on eBay. And it, this was like the first week of release or whatever it right. was like. And he's, you know, dutifully sent them. They were great. I've got them, you know, over here. And, I got lucky because apparently after they did that first distribution, every single time I've gone into a Walmart, it looks like all the Lady J's have like scare clown makeup on. Like they're all just like, <laughs> ah. And I'm thinking, wow, I lucked out because like mine actually looked decent. You know, mine looked good. But my point in saying that is I was okay with that because I'm not trying to collect everything. So I'm not going to have to pay a scalper constantly for all this stuff. I, I'm yeah. only every now and then. Now I, I'll go into a store and if I find something, I'll grab it. You know, like a, that's cool. But a lot of times, like you said, it's it's tumbleweeds in those aisles. It's like, oh, it's it's the same Jurassic Park dinosaurs and some wrestling figures and a lot of McFarland DC stuff. and. Yeah. Vintage collection Lando Cowers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tony was here. So when Tony was here for Joe Fest, uh, we uh we went to the he'd never been to a Walmart. So I took him to the Walmart by my house. And um anybody who wants a toy aisle to not look derelict, get an Australian to fly here and then take him to Walmart. And suddenly yeah. the aisle is just filled to the gills. But that we were going down the aisles of Target and Walmart near my house, and I I made this joke where I, I was like, it's all Landos, Mandos, and Randos because it was it was yeah. all Landos, various versions of Boba Fett and other Mandalorian characters, and yeah. then just random garbage all over the. Uh, and so we joked that for the rest of the week it was like Landos, Mandos, and Randos is what's in the toy aisles right now. And we saw every version of Lando that I think's ever been in all those stores. We saw the Bespin Lando from Empire uh, TVC. We saw the General Lando. We saw the Skiff Guard Lando. And we even saw a Rise of Skywalker Lando still hanging around. Like, Dang. it was nuts. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we took um, we took Zazel from Sergeant Slaughter Slaughterhouse. We took him mm -hmm. to Walmart just so he could experience it. We were yeah. like, yep, we're going to take you to Walmart, man, because you yep. got to. Yep. <laughs> and then uh, TJC, our good friend from uh, the UK, says just because with a five-pound super chat. So. Thanks, buddy. There's a Mega Force Super Kiss just for you. And uh, M. Vargo says, but streaming looks so much better, said no one ever. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so crushed and so compressed. Oh, yeah. And then uh, Ted Darklaw says, don't give the guru a reason to make another crappy T-shirt. But who's buying it? I mean. Yeah. And then uh, Robert's Infinite Realm says, they've not marketed a toy line to kids in decades. They know who's buying. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Chronically Online says, rhymes with boy poo-poo. Wait, that actually <laughs> describes him. Never mind. 
<laughs> World made of cardboard. I showed a picture of a Toys R Us aisle 7C to my daughters. They had never seen floor to ceiling toys before. I miss those days. Uh, me too. Me too. They would pull out the ladder and get the stuff from way up at the ceiling mm -hmm. and then fill it. Oh, God. Yep. That was so great. 100% like Halcyon days, those. Yeah. And even and even some of the law the 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 less thought about stores uh, at the time from back then they were toy powerhouses too in that regard like yeah. service merchandise service merchandise yeah, service merchandise what's that yeah I said yeah service yeah 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 uh, Hills Sears uh, Se which one Sears Sears oh yeah Sears Zayers Montgomery yeah. Ward Mo yeah um, Montgomery Ward yeah because yeah. Sears had all those exclusives Kmart. Mm -hmm. Kmart, oh my Kmart god! Kmart had toys like mad. Oh man, you wanted Kmart was the only place you could, 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 as I stutter, could consistently go to find the diecast Voltrons. Like that, yeah. was, they always had them, you know. Yep. So uh, and I could just stare at them and not buy them. And then uh, Retro Nomad, my buddy Nick says the industry is only focusing on the adult collectors, and it's losing. Uh, it's a losing and short-sighted strategy that will bite them in the ass hard soon. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Nick, thanks for that super chat, man. Yep. But, yeah. I've just uh, so Michael, you made the analogy, and I've um, I don't want to say I stole it. Uh, it's not even imitations, which is the best form of flattery, so they say, right? But I completely agreed with your analogy that um, nostalgia and nostalgia baiting and only marketing to collectors is like that glider you mm -hmm. know, that will fly for a minute. Yep. So and then it, it'll, it'll, a very it'll, astute analogy. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I uh in moments of sarcastic desperation, I I tend to sling venom. So, yeah. But no, that 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 is the thing. It's it's, it's a short it's a short-sighted strategy as as the the one commenter just said. It's yep. it it it's it's a short-term gain but a long-term loss. It really um, is. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it reminds me of uh you know, some moments in history where they thought, oh, this will this will be this will be a great idea. You know, we'll win the day. And it's like, no, you'll win the day, but you won't win the the month, the year, the war. You know, nope. you're yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if... lessons learned. Right. So it, everything throughout history is kind of based on lessons learned. And, um, yeah, you know what what you just uh, stated, it it just reminds me immediately of Operation Market Garden. You know, like, yes, we're going to go into Holland and we're going to cut this war short. <laughs> Oops. <Bad idea. laughs> kind of actually that just delayed you a lot longer. Yeah. Like, and that's oops. the thing. So, you know, I see a lot of parallels between um, the entertainment industry, i.e. like televisions, movies, things like that, streaming services mm -hmm. and toys. Yeah. Where. I, I look at, let's just say. Snake eyes. Uh huh. We're gonna we're gonna look at GI Jesus. So the the Snake Eyes Origins movie, I take that in one hand, and then I take everything post Disney acquisition of Lucasfilm mm -hmm. that they put out. So Star Wars is no longer an event, right? It's no longer based on like an overarching story like trilogy or anything like that. It's not about like lessons of fathers and sons and you know triumphs and tragedies and training and the hard work, right? It's all about downloading the force and dumb shit. And then the Snake Eyes origin movie, you know, you you take this silent, honorable, broken, but reliable, resilient guy, and you make him this loudmouth, annoying asshole who stabs everyone in the back, and he's he lies to everyone, and he steals from them. And the only problems that they cause throughout the movie is him causing them. You're right. And the parallels that I make is that if you didn't make that snake eyes movie if you just deleted it right and you mm -hmm. you know the what those corporations do is they're like well we're not going to put it out and it's going to be a tax write-off at the end of the year and woo you know we just saved 40 or 80 million dollars in tax write-offs because we didn't put that movie out and hurt the brand right and today i was watching wdw pro and they were breaking down all of the numbers of what Lucasfilm has cost the Disney Corporation uh -huh. the $4 uh -huh. billion dollar acquisition, how much it costs to make each movie, the prints and advertisings, everything, the parks, Star Cruiser, the whole nine yards, everything that every single dollar that Disney has sunk into Star, just Star Wars. Not We're not even talking Willow or Indiana right. Jones. I know you loved that last indie movie, didn't you? <sighs> I didn't even see it. 
but I, I'm, I'm, I'm on, I'm on hour three of my, of my eventual review video. It's going to be like four hours long and I'm wor I was working on it all day today. So yeah, that's, that's the video that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Indiana Sweet. Jones five review. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a four, it's going to be a four hour long video, but please keep talking. I want to hear the rest of your point. So anyway, uh, I guess my point is when, when all was said and done and they crunched the numbers, you know, and they're doing a bunch of rocket science math, they're like star Wars, mm -hmm. just star Wars. The Star Wars part of Lu of the Lucasfilm acquisition has cost Disney like nine point seven billion dollars, right? And after all is said and done with you know the revenues and what they earn, and they say like, well, this movie made two billion dollars, but you didn't make two billion dollars, right? You made maybe six hundred million, uh huh. But you put out, you know, this much more, and so right. right so it's that slow slide of diminishing returns. Yep. And the way that I look at it is that it, just these decisions, the, the decision-making process is, is completely broken because mm -hmm. you've got people that don't understand these products. And we're, no. we're not just talking like pop culture and movies and TV shows, but we're, we're also talking toys because there, there's parallels between the two because the, the characters, mm -hmm. they're so ingrained in our, in our culture and in our zeitgeist and in our personalities where you could just leave them alone and a you wouldn't damage the brand b you right. wouldn't like cost yourselves a lot of money and everybody headache at the same time and that right it kind of sucks mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah it, it's it's a little frustrating because as much as i love star wars as soon as they killed the eu and then they start robbing the eu like yep. you know like they're grave robbers trying to build frankenstein's monster Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh, yeah, we killed the EU, but here's Thrawn. You know, here's this one. Here's that one. I'm waiting for Mara Jade to show up, and then I can just get really mad. Oh, yeah, me too, because Mara yeah. Jade is my favorite EU character. Yeah. And um, after that, it's the Rogue Squadron books, which yes. I thought were great. Before they made Koran a Jedi, I I, I kind of jumped off after that, because I'm like, why does everybody have to become a Jedi? Yeah, yeah, and um, that's we're still there. Everybody's a Jedi. Like, why is Sabine training to be a Jedi? Like, where was right. that in Rebels? It was yeah. nowhere. I'm waiting for her to just like grab a broomstick or whatever. Like I, I, I Oh yeah, broom kid. Yeah, broom kid. Like the thing, <laughs> the thing is, is that you were talking just a second ago about how they make these bad decisions and then they break, you know, they break these franchises. Yeah. If 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 I wasn't so confident in my observations about just general corporate ineptitude, about like you said, they don't know what these franchises are about that they own. Right. I would swear that they map out these failures on a grid before they make the choice because they, they, their ignorance of these properties is always so epidemic that they always manage to make the worst choice possible. So let's, I'm going to put my head on the chopping block and let's, let's just take your example of the snake eyes movie. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like snake eyes, is beloved by our generation. He is, uh, he and Storm Shadow's saga is one of the best story arcs that was ever in G.I. Joe. Whether or not you think the two characters are overexposed, you got to take your mind back to the 80s and remember how it was when it first un right. unfurled, right? Right. And the reason it's so good is because of how expertly told the story was by Larry Hama. He, he knew that the story was of you know, a frame job and a misunderstanding. And it was, it was the gasoline was poured on that fire because one of those characters was a foreigner in someone else's land. And it was, you know, it became yes. this whole thing, right? Yeah. Stranger well, in a strange land. Yes. Yeah. So you take the corporate attitude of they crunched some numbers. They had their actuarial marketing people look at it and they were like, oh, well, Snake Eyes is definitely the most popular character in G.I. Joe. By the way, everybody, I am um, mimicking a uh, a female marketing person. I am not mimicking anybody male persuasion, to just be clear. Um, soccer mom. I love to do the, the example of soccer mom. I'm doing my soccer mom voice, so don't get paranoid out there, everybody. Um, and uh, and so they say, we know that, that, that Snake Eyes is the most popular uh, G.I. Joe character. And they're like, great, what do we need to do to get him a movie? And it's like, well, we need to make sure that, you know, we have him in a mask and we have him swing a sword and we have him all in black. 
and call the movie Snake Eyes and it's going to make money. And yep. it's like, ooh, n- no, that's that. No, <laughs> yeah. that's not a good yeah. idea. And then they turn around and everybody, I'm not talking about your ideal here. Everybody has their ideal vision of what a great G.I. Joe movie would be. And that includes the aesthetics and the window dressing. I need you to follow me right now. Everybody in the chat, follow me on the core uh, direction, the core um, motivation of the Snake Eyes Storm Shadow story. Okay. So what I'm about to say, don't let it ruffle your feathers. Just follow me on this. For the Snake Eyes story to work and be effective, first of all, you have to actually use that story. We'll ride right past that. Let's say we're using it. All right. Snake Eyes, the hilarious part about that movie, he could have been anybody of any ethnicity but Asian for it to work. And it, and like I said, it's like they mapped it out on a grid and they went, he's a ninja, so we don't want to do a um, we don't want to misappropriate him possibly. So oh, we're gonna yeah, make that, him that, that cultural reappropriation crap. Right. So we're gonna make him this, and it's like, oh my god, like. You guys literally broke the entire potential, the reason the whole story exists. And I want to be clear to everybody out there, like whether you are adamant that Snake Eyes should just be exactly the way he looks in the comic book, that's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about what does it take for the mythology to work, regardless of the of the window dressing. And the fact of the matter is, is that they had to stupidly plot that choice out on like a map and, and blow everything up. Yep. Because you could have literally had him be anybody else on the planet, and that that story would have worked. Yeah, it, it, it it's amazing to me. It's the same thing with uh, the Force Awakens with with Luke Skywalker and all that stuff. You know, they they talked about how J.J. Abrams kept wanting Luke in the story, but uh, Michael Arndt, the screenwriter, uh, he did a an interview with the screenwriters. Anytime you website. put him in. Yeah, every time you put him in, suddenly J.J. Abrams' characters lose all their agency. Yeah, he overshadows them. It's like, well, maybe that should be a hint that you need to rethink the entire concept of this movie. Yeah, maybe this needs yeah. to finish off the Luke Skywalker, Leia, Han story or leave them out of it entirely. One way or the other, don't don't square peg the round hole. Like, don't do that. And they're like, no, no. And so what did they do? They made, they made the worst choice possible. The worst choice. They... They always lead themselves to the worst choice you can make. And, yeah. it, you know, like, yep. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and just to point it out, as you were saying, all that stuff about ethnicities and all that, our good friend George Aiken said, American Ninja, anybody? Mm-hmm. That's the, yeah, that's like the whole point of American Ninja. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I got some, I got some good comments for you here, Michael. Okay. Uh, real quick. Uh, my buddy Brandon R from Canada sends a Canadian ten dollars super chat. Thank you, Brandon. I I saw it. We were just in the moment. Do you think Hasbro would rather just cut out retailers altogether? Ah, see, this is something, Michael. You've talked about mm-hmm. this, and I've talked about it too. Mm-hmm. Uh, to become the Amazon of their own products, the price is the same. Why share with Walmart if you don't have to? Well. I, I mean, with the way that the toy industry is going, uh, you know, catering to adults more and more and more with distribution becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And with Walmart being the worst people to mail order oh, from so bad, like Walmart is the worst at getting figures. You should have seen my you should, you should have seen my Black Series uh, Empire Strikes Back 40th R2D2. Like it good thing I'm an opener. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but point being is that. I can see no downside from the side of adult consumers, but that also means that there's no possibility for redemption of child-driven toy lines. In other right. words, you're just saying, let's let child-driven toys die, which I think is a crime. Um, they need to be refocusing on that and trying to win back some of that audience, and they're not. They Corporations always choose the path of least resistance, even after they've yeah. broken something. Yeah. So that that's what they're doing. So I think this is... This is a faster way to the death of of toys because if if kids aren't coming up through the ranks being interested in toys, then we're looking at the last generation of people who are going to have any vested interest in appreciating toys. Yeah, and then at that point, there's always there's always in a group of kids, there's always that 
sort of Luddite anachronistic kid who loves bow ties and loves old typewriters and stuff like that. And they'll want to collect old toys because, but they're one in a thousand kids. Like they're not going to be. Yeah. They're, they're that one kid friend that you had who had all the weird metal wind up Japanese yeah. robots. And you're like, where's your Joe's? He's like, Oh, I got these cool metal wind up mm-hmm. Japanese robots. Right. right. But you know, the, this question that Brandon sort of asked, it, it brings up that conversation of, when you see these retailers and they're like, oh, they're going up for pre-sale on our website today at this time. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's if they're lucky enough to schedule the pre-sale window after the stream like they've mm-hmm. failed to do several times before. And I just laugh right. forever about it. Yeah. But, you know, toys going up for pre-sale on a company's website, some kid's not going to go grab his dad's credit card and wait, you know, for the sale to start so they can you know, frantically race and try to get that one figure before a pre-sale sells out. And how right. the hell do pre-sales sell out? But Haslabs, they won't sell out of Haslabs because that's money in the bank, you know, and that that's a whole other argument unto itself. Well, somebody, I saw somebody the other day try and claim that Haslabs, they were arguing with somebody on 3POA in the comments. They, sure. said, that, they said that Haslabs were not crowd funds, they were pre-orders. And I'm no. like, I'm like, dude, oh. If you don't make the minimum number of backers, the thing doesn't get made. That means it's a crowdfund. Like the minimum that, number of backers pays for the molds. Exactly. Yeah. Like if you don't get the thing because enough people don't buy it, then guess what? It ain't no pre-order. Like that. That's not pre-order. Not that's, good. that's like that's like saying a Kickstarter's a pre-order. Yeah. That, yeah that's not. basically what he was saying was that he oh no, Has, Hasbro's made it very clear. These are pre-orders. They're not, it's like wherever you read that, it was probably from some other Joe Blow and he wasn't good with details either. So, you know, yeah, and, and that's, that's the kind of frustrating interaction because it, it's all on digits. It, it's all internet, you know, communication and you, you can't hear tone. You can't hear people's inflection. Mm-hmm. Immediately people get on the defensive. It's like I'm not trying to say you're dumb, but you know, you were wrongly informed or you, you right. misinterpret what that yeah. model is. But yeah. And then, um, we also got to point out the elephant in the room that in a lot of what EU countries and things like that, Hasbro was like, the only way you can get these toys is from Pulse. Boop. Right. They dropped yeah. that bomb. I so mean, I, I, it, really, I it, them, it, yeah. it really, it really emphasizes the whole throwing away the EU thing that we talked about with Lucasfilm, except now it's global and now it's real for everyone. Yeah. And then uh, Robert's infinite realm says, everyone gets force powers, says Oprah. <laughs> You get force powers and you get force powers. Look under your seat. Force powers. And then uh, just Jeff says, uh, French, don't you dare naysay Corin Horn, sir. First of all, I liked Corin Horn. I read all those books until the moment they were like, what was it? I Jedi or something like that. Where suddenly yeah, I Jedi. Came, On the he became a force user. And I'm like, uh-huh. I liked him better as a fighter pilot, just a fighter pilot. That's why yeah. I lo- look, I like Luke Skywalker, but. But my point is that it's also nice to have some variety of the characters. And that's why we love Wedge Antilles so much. So like Coran right. Horn was this post Return of the Jedi fighter pilot who was just trying to survive in a, you know, uh, uh, what did they call the, the Empire back then? The Remnant in the Remnant, yeah, the Remnant era. And, and I, loved, Remnant. I loved that. And and so for them to just make him another Jedi, look at where the Star Wars franchise has gone, Jeff. I mean, now everybody's a Jedi. Like it's. It, uh, you I, get a Jedi and you get a Jedi. Even the Mandalorian was handed a dark saber at one point. Yeah. Like it's like guys, yeah. and see, and that's what Media Clash is saying. Well, Kanan trained her to use the dark saber. Sure, yeah, Kanan trained her to use the dark saber, but that there was no Master Padawan thing with Ahsoka or any of that going on. But I, granted, I understand it's actually like so many years later. Right. Uh, here you go. Roundhead Ryan is now a Jedi. <laughs> He's the, uh, dest- yeah, the destroyer of worlds. Oh God. He's so, you know, and as soon as I read that, that interview where he said he started writing the last Jedi before the force awakens even came out and he, he didn't like, he had to be convinced to put R2 D2 in uh-huh. the last Jedi because right. Yeah. Yeah. They're just, they're so, oh, it's so bad. <laughs> yeah. It, gone are the days when. You know, Kirshner's directing and Lucas is over here going, yeah, yeah, those those dailies look pretty good, yeah. And then he's <laughs> like, uh, yeah, Ford just uh, said 
I know, and I'm going to leave it in there. No, I, 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 I don't think you should leave that. And he left it in. You know, gone are those days. Now, it's- yeah, gone are the days where you, you you had a few brave people that pushed back on Lucas. Yeah, you made him so angry he wouldn't hire him back for the next film. <laughs> but they made the best. Yeah, movie Gary Kurtz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they made the best movie in the whole series, and you know. But hey, it's like I said, it's okay if you if you think it's the worst. Yeah. I I don't judge you publicly. 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 Yeah. World Made of Cardboard hasn't even watched the Snake Eyes movie. Don't do it. Um, it's worse than Batman and Robin. Mm-hmm. And I saw some comments in here where people were saying, oh, you know, you got to make him white. You got to make him white. Look, like I said, you guys, like that, if that's your ideal, whatever, what I'm trying to drill down to is even if, even if we, if we jettison that, if we look at the mythos, the core mythos of the story, it's about a, it's about a guy who's not Japanese. Yeah, like that's the core of the story. So that's the irony of it is that he could have been anybody. Um, well, the, yeah, you know. there's so much rich history and lore, and and again, mm-hmm. like Lucas made Star Wars. He's borrowing from Kurosawa, and he's borrowing right. from old westerns and gunslinger movies and things like that. And like you look at the Snake Eyes Storm Shadow relationship, look at all the stuff that Bruce Lee had to go through to bring mm-hmm. Kung Fu to the Western right. world. They were like. No, those are our secrets. Like, don't give mm-hmm. that to the white man. Like, right. It's very much compartmentalized. Like, we don't do that. Right. And, and that's and, yeah. kind of the whole thing with Snake Eyes. Storm Shadow got his clan to bring him in, and then he outpaced Storm Shadow. And next thing you know, like you said, right. pouring gasoline on that fire. And that's the whole thing. Like, the yeah. if Hollywood if Hollywood needed to to, you know, make certain you know, entities happy or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, check they, had, they had a perfect way in the modern world to simply say, as long as he's not, as long as he's not Asian, the foreigner fish out of water thing works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then we, and then we have, that's my point is that they, they comically fumbled the ball so bad that they yeah. wrecked the entire core of the story. Yeah, exactly. And that's what Hollywood does. You and, know? and I made I made the same kind of observation that you had just stated previously. I was on another stream and somebody was asking me about it. I was like, all they knew about Snake Eyes was Ninja Sword, Black Suit. Like, yep. that's all they knew. And they were like, and oh, that, man, that, that we too. can do whatever we want. It's like, right. no, you got left and right limits. Stop it. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think this is partially a statement and partially a request of you. Okay. We need... A shipwreck solo film. <laughs> oh man, can you see that trailer? Like, just, I mean, like, what what would that look like? Shipwreck, uh, GI Joe origin shipwreck, and it's just it's just him, like, what at a strip club or something, and yeah. you know he's just kind of hanging out, you know, waiting for Destiny, who's actually the name of the stripper. And then, you know, G.I. Joe comes in and it's like, we got a mission for you. And it's just like, oh, that would be my worst nightmare. Oh, I, yeah. I, 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 I cannot, I cannot stand shipwreck. <laughs> but, but I don't, I don't hate people or anything that like him. Like mm-hmm. I like, I'm not trying to, you know, take away your joy or anything like that. I'm yeah. just, shipwreck. I liked shipwreck the one time he was in the G.I. Joe comic pro- prominently because he was used properly. And then Hama, yes. who was one of the few, characters he did not create han was like yeah i used him i'm moving on now like shipwreck is nope yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah. and then uh you know then there were those times they would hasbro would make him put the ballistic battle ball in there and he'd be like yep put it in there and uh, went back to the drawing board it's gone (laughs) you know he just wanted to hear you do shipwreck he would he would oh well yeah of course speaking of which Mm -hmm. our good friend drew g is here and uh, he said that he thought your corporate voice sounded like me. My corporate voice? Oh, you mean the, uh, are you talking about the marketing person? I, so I don't know. Do <clears throat> he just threw it up while we were talking. And I, I thought he wanted to get you to do your Skeletor voice. Because if we want to do Snake Eyes, the movie, we should break it. Break it by making him an Asian guy rather than anyone else, because then the story cannot be told. And then we will rake in all kinds of tax subsidies from our, what what do they call that? Economy guy. Tell me what it is. I don't remember. It's a tax break. That's what it is. We will break them with our tax break. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
we had a bunch of other people pop in too. So uh, Mikey from JMK Designs got here and um, Johnny from Simple Tricks and Nonsense. And Johnny said that he got here just in time for the Snake Eyes train wreck conversation, which was good. Mm. And um, another $5 super chat from my good friend, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Says, three-fourths of the classified line is Target and Walmart exclusives. Is Hasbro bribing them just to stay in the game? That's a good point. And the the first part is a very good point. Yes, it's yes. it's a line that is primarily exclusives. Yeah, and if it goes online only, uh, you know, as as we see it dry up in stores, because yep. there's a, there's been all that speculation that it's going to go online only. Like I, the, I'm the, waiting I, for it. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm like ninety percent convinced it's coming. Yeah, exactly. Like it's. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's very possible. I that is that is a move that will not surprise me if it happens. Nope. So. And you know they could still do their Walmart and Target because they can do their Walmart Con and they can do their Target stuff and mm -hmm. they could keep their exclusivity deals with them with their repaints, yep, and retros and whatever. Yep. That is that is one thing that that blows me away about that line is when when you look at you know, whatever they're at, like now 110 or however mm -hmm. many numbers they have. And, you know, they have no visual language throughout their packaging, mm -hmm. but just how much the majority is exclusives and or repaints or exclusive. Repaints. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then they just repaint a thing they already made and somehow the price went up. Yeah. They're like, look, it's caramel crunch snake eyes. Yeah. Oh, we, we put tiger stripes on that Ram cycle now. So now it's $15 more or whatever. And it's mm -hmm. like, uh what you know that that's why i've i've been very hands off with gi joe classifieds barring uh the classic ladies i got i got the lady although i'm i'm still having to like futz around figuring out how i'm going to cobble together a good scarlet but other than that i've you know i've got everybody and i'm i'm uh, until they decide to make a good jinx i'm out you know like i've got cover girls arana baroness lady j and i've got the um the movie scarlet that I've, i thought about repainting and then i got lazy which but, is the, the better sculpt of scarlet yeah that original scarlet repainted makes a great quarrel oh oh okay yeah that's a good point i hadn't thought of that i'll okay. send you pictures of it later yeah that'd be great yeah because yeah, um, um, i know you're a big fan of palatoys i do yeah yeah uh and then jeremy says uh jeremy thanks man for the five dollar mm -hmm. super chat he says enough of this toxicity <laughs> If you could have any row beast <laughs> made to scale with any Voltron, which would you choose and what company would produce it? Man, that's a good question. Uh, you know what? They've never made, um, I can't remember his name. Is it Surak? He was the general with one eye who, who was turned into a row beast to yes. be punished for his, yep. because they've never made Surak in any action figure form. I think it would be great to do the row beast Surak because then he, He's a beast that that Voltron can fight, and he's finally represented in the line in in some shape, form, or fashion. That's the first one I would choose. Yeah, it serves two masters. Yeah, that's that's actually mm -hmm. a really good answer. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy, thanks for that. So now we're uh, now we're talking about row beasts and Voltron. <laughs> like, how many times do they have to reinvent Voltron? Like, you know, I've seen all your Voltron videos mm. where they'll they'll come out with one and you'll get it, and then they'll come out with another. And in your video, you're like, yeah, I didn't want to get it, but I got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's because they're always so increasingly expensive. Like they keep, that's why I said that the, the Blitzway Carbotics one was the last one. I'm like, look, I just paid, uh, guys, I just paid $700 for a Voltron. Like, and the only reason I did it was because I thought this, this may finally be the definitive one. experience. Yeah. yeah. And for me, by and large, it was it was 99% dialed in and then it had a lot of good stuff going for it. Yeah. But the first comments are always from these like, you know, squirrely, like, you know, like Chagokin obsessies who are like, <laughs> I believe it's lacking in plastic. There's too much plastic here. And I, I do not think it is worth it. I'm going to hold out for another. And then like, there were people, there was one guy that actually said to me, he was like, I think the carbotics one is crap. I actually liked the Maddie Collector one, and now I wait for one in the Maddie Collector size that is fully die cast with no plastic. And I'm like, you're you're gonna be waiting a really, really long time to yeah, know. Yeah, that's it. a that's a tall order right there, buddy. Yeah, it's like I don't like the one that's actually really decent. I like the one that's noticeably crappy, 
but it's because I'm looking at what we what we were talking about that aspirational thing of I'm going to hold on to this empty dream that I yeah. came up with, you know. I I I feel really fortunate that my aspirational toy dreams were far more reasonable like oh one day I hope they come out with short-haired dazzler in Marvel Legends and yeah. they did. Yeah. And I was like, oh, "Wow, they finally did that. Cool." Like, you know, but can I can I get a morph? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Thanks, Jeremy. And then uh, Just Jeff sends a $5 super chat. Thank you. It says, it's hard for us 40-somethings to understand the change, the push of do it this way because we want the shit to make sense and we can't make it make sense. <laughs> oh, you're going to have so much fun with my Indy 5 review then. I it's can't wait. Four, it's four hours of that. Of, oh, I can't I want, wait to see it. I want it to make sense and it doesn't make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? I'll give you I'll give you a little I'll give you a little um an example tease. Okay. This this is just one of the ones where you go, huh? What? Okay, so there's this there's this moment where they they make this really big deal out of the fact that the little kid, or I say little kid, he's probably like 14 or whatever, 12, 14, he's 14, 15, something like that. This like kid that's uh Phoebe Waller Bridge's sidekick. She uh he's like her short round and he's good at pickpocketing. Right. And so at one point in the movie, he pickpockets Antonio Banderas's Zippo lighter, but Banderas doesn't know it. And he's not, he's not a villain in the movie. He's like a friend of Indy or whatever. Yeah. But like, there's like this big moment that they, they call out where he's like, he's like, what happened to my lighter? And Phoebe Waller Bridge looks over at this kid named Teddy in the movie. And he's like playing with the lighter and he's like, Ooh, and he puts it in his pocket and she like smiles at him like, tee hee hee. I know what you did. You know, like, so then flash forward like five minutes and the bad guys are, you know, like if you don't translate this tablet, we're going to, you know, kill you all or whatever. And so, yeah. and so Phoebe Waller bridge is like, I'll translate the tablet because I don't want to get shot, you know, or whatever. And so she starts, you know, playing the, you know, she is a mercenary. She's a, she's a mercenary for hire essentially. Anyway, she's right. all about the money. So she starts really playing that up, lulling him into a false sense of security, walking around the room, and she's translating the thing. And then she comes back up to Mads Mikkelsen. Now that she's sort of won him over with her, with some confidence, she just asks him for his already lit cigarette. And she just takes it from him. And she's like, hey. And then she wanders over to Indiana Jones. And she like shows him that she's got like dynamite in her pocket. And now she needs to stay there with her back to him with her one hand with the cigarette behind her back while he sits there and fumbles trying to get the cigarette to light the fuse on the dynamite. And you sit there and you go, didn't your boy, Teddy, who's sitting right there, just steal a Zippo lighter? Why do you need to do this? Like, yeah. like you are literally risking this whole dumb, uh, you know, dog and pony show to, to, to what? Act like you're some sort of like Robert Redford in the sting or something like, like a confidence man or something like that. Like you've literally pulled this whole ruse pointlessly because the writers are bad at their jobs. Like you've just shown us that there is a Zippo lighter in this room yeah, right with the person she's sitting next to. And she has to do all this because what? You guys got clever in the writing room, but you were so clever. You actually showed how stupid you were. Like it, it's that kind of stuff where the onion just keeps getting peeled away yeah. and, the, and the story just gets dumber and dumber. It's, it's yeah. You know, and, and that's something else that I knew we were going to get around to was like this whole, you know, creative bankruptcy that we see with toys, mm -hmm. um, you know, because if it's not Snake Eyes, it's got to be a repaint of Snake Eyes and so yep. on and so forth. Um, or, you know, it's got to be another Wolverine. Yeah. Oh. And, and then movies. So, like, you know, you just pointed out a great example. These people, they don't they don't understand, you know, and, and we were talking about Snake Eyes. And then I, I start mm -hmm. a comment where, um, in fact, I'll put it up right now, where JLS Comics says, Get rid of Lorenzo de Bonaventura and it's instantly better. Yeah, absolutely, man. You got to get rid of that, dude. But how do you get these guys out of the way? How do you get Iger out of the way? How do you get Lorenzo out of the way? How do you get know. Kathleen Kennedy out of the way? They just stick around. Like they, yeah, because that kind of goes back to the whole creative bankruptcy where they, they have this whole thing, you know, in that weird sycophantic mm -hmm. culture that they're in where they, they, all they do is fail upward. I don't want to say fail forward because when you fail forward, you learn from your mistakes 
and you correct as you proceed, but right. they fail upward, you know, and uh-huh. then they, they, they stay around and it's like flop after flop after flop. And let's just keep doing the same formula because it's not working yet. <laughs> Maybe yeah. it'll work next time. And it's almost like they're, it's almost like they, they're more comfortable with being comfortable with the people in the room than by yeah. fixing the problem that would give them the better product. Right. You know, and th- and that's why when I when I put out that car rant yesterday, and I, I started talking about groupthink, mm-hmm. because you you know that's exactly what you're talking about right there. It's that groupthink, right. like, well, I don't want to bring it up because then I'll be the only one who brings it up, and so on and so forth. And then the you know the example you made about the lighter, it's like script writing run one oh one. There's right. that old adage: if you show a gun on the mantle in the first scene, in the second scene that that gun, or in the first act, in the second mm-hmm. act that gun better go off. Yes. And so, like, you're talking about the lighter, and they're just going round and round. It's like, just pull the stupid lighter out. It's almost like they forgot that they did that. They didn't associate it with the next thing because they're not they're not good writers. They, yeah. the, my my friend at work years ago, she coined this term simplexity. Yes, where, and I used that term after you brought it up. I've used it numerous times. Well, I'm I'm I'm, I'm sure Elizabeth would be flattered. Um, uh, the the funny part is that's what you see in these poorly written movies where all they think is, well, if I just make this moment really intricate and then you go, but it's needlessly intricate. You have mucked up the works. You have, you have, you have stopped up the flow. Like that you have literally broken the plumbing on this. Um, If you had just thought about this more in a more straightforward fashion, um, this story would work and the pacing would be fine and everything would make sense and nobody would be angry. Right. But you guys like, yeah, it's yeah. And and that kind of is speaking of flow and works mm-hmm. and all that. Uh, Big Bacon says Hollywood is literally a toilet. Shit flows to the top. Big ones won't flush. True. <laughs> True. That explains that explains a lot about why they won't go away. Yeah. And then chronically says the way to get rid of them is take them all to a trip to the Grand Canyon, convince them to take a selfie as they're walking backwards. Don't tell them the edge is there. Again, yeah. he's he's taking the complex out of it. That's just. Right? Simple. That's just simple. <laughs> it's simplicity. Yeah. Gravity is your friend. Yeah. But the, you know that it kind of comes back around to mm-hmm. like everything that we've been talking about where how how can you get rid of a Kathleen Kennedy? Well, you can't because she has mm-hmm. that 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 no fault clause in her contract. Yep. So she she can't be gotten rid of. Uh obviously neither can Lorenzo Di Bonaventura or maybe they just um you know, sometimes w- whatever Spock says, the most uh, probable right. answer, however unlikely. Yep. We're we're in an era. They just don't care. <laughs> you know, oh, they yeah. don't care to get rid of them. No, they don't. And and we're in an era where, because so many studios and and companies in the toy industry as well have con- been consolidated under just a few names, just a few megacorps. Yep. That the moment you get a few bad leaders at the top of even a few of those companies you're in trouble for a long time. So like right now we've got Iger at the top of Disney. We've got Zaslav at the top of Warner Brothers. Yep. That, those two awesome. alone are a disaster for, for the film industry because yep. underneath them, they're making all those decisions. They're, that's why I said in the video I did a few weeks ago, and some people didn't understand what I was saying, is that to cheer on the CEOs because they're not coming back to the negotiating table with the writers yeah. isn't going to solve anything at the end of the day because yes the writers are bad yes the writers are subpar yes it's it's nepotism run amuck in the industry now yes, but sir. the people that chose those writers and championed those writers are the ones at the top still making all the money the igers the zaslavs all those people so mm-hmm. until those people go it, you'll, they'll just they'll just find a new crop of people willing to write whatever they're told to write or they'll get ai to do it so yeah, it's like, and right now they're looking to like, mm-hmm. you know, Asian markets and things like that. Like, what can we buy? Like, yeah, like all of us are dead. That, that, right. you know, the zombie show that was on Netflix. They're like, what can we buy and just scoop it up? You know, we need another one of these types of shows and just put it on. Right. What was it? Squid game or something like Squid that? Game, yeah. Yeah. Like that. The only way that this really is going to change, I think, is for the establishment to collapse in in the industry, both yeah. the toy industry and because like right now you've got independent toy companies making all kinds of superior products. And yes. even even corporations that are smaller, but they're respected, 
they're making lower volume but better products for adult collectors most of the time and in the movie industry you've got the same problem we need to be championing independent film we need to be championing a24 productions things like that you know when i went and saw i, I got wind of it because of it was the only youtube commercial ad i've ever not skipped because they did it right and i was suddenly interested it was the trailer for sisu and so i was like yes. what is this and sisu. i started yeah so I ran off to the theater. I was I was one of like, you know, I don't know, 600 people in the country that saw that in the movie theater. But um, when I saw that and I walked out because the trailers had already been happening for Indiana Jones 5. Right. And I already knew it was going to be Stinkorama. And I remember walking out and looking at Melinda and saying, gosh, you know, it's really a shame that a studio like that, a, a small production company like that, which put every dollar up on the screen like it and it was unafraid to do a movie that was both you know heightened heightened mythology it was it was a fictional film but it was yeah. also it was it was okay with being uncomfortable like it yeah. was like we're not going to shy away from the story we want to tell because yeah, yeah we're, we're going to set it in the german retreat yeah. yeah, and we're and we're not going to be afraid to show violence, and we're not going to be. This is going to be first blood in Finnish World War II dialed up to twenty, and yeah. we're okay with that. And I sit back and I go, I, I told Melinda driving home, I said, "That's what people forget is is that's what movies like Raiders of the Lost Ark felt like in 1980. They were like things that are 81. They were things that people never seen before, like the first Conan the Barbarian and stuff like that, yeah. and they have." they have bought up all of the IP that, that created, generated all of those great movies. Right. And now they're, they're, they're very worried about all of their, their marketing demographics and all of their focus groups and all that stuff where yep. they don't want to take risks anymore. And I, and I sat back and I told Melinda, I was like, it's really a shame that, that, you know, when, when these franchises uh, get sold, they get sold as part of the property of, companies in other words you absorb the companies almost like the borg like the borg is yeah. absorbing you know the collective yeah. intelligence of whatever and and i'm like it's too bad that they couldn't part and parcel them out where they go well yes this property under our umbrella definitely should go here to this studio because its culture is geared for it right this property though I don't think you guys should really own this. This is not your forte. This is not something you'd be brave enough to do. Yeah. We're going to court another company over here to sell this piece off. Like, and, but they don't do that. They, they just vacuum everything up and then things disappear into the vault. So, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and that's, that's the whole thing with, uh, you know, Kenner getting absorbed into the Hasbro uh, Borg collective. But yep. I'm glad they haven't really touched mask. I mean, aside from they did uh, specialist Matt Tracker and they did general Miles Mayhem for the modern Joes. Right. I was OK with that. Mm -hmm. But I I am so fearful that someone is going to, you know, just get this idea that, oh, I'm going to make six inch mask figures with no vehicles. And then I'll just start screaming into my pillow. Yep. Um, yep. JLS Comics says Sisu was fun. Who doesn't love a World War II style? World War II John Wick in the style of Robert Rodriguez, <laughs> which, which if you trace that back, that's that's Robert Rodriguez's um, uh, in the the spaghetti westerns that influenced him. Desperado and all that. Yeah. It, it all evolves on itself, you know. You know, and if we talk about the whole six degrees of separation, so talking about Sisu, talking about Robert Rodriguez, and when we were having the discussion about the simplexity, and you, mm -hmm. you know, you just layer, layer, layer scenes that really needed room to breathe and they needed yep. nuance and things like that. Clint Eastwood is one of those guys where he can convey any kind of message with just a look. Yes. And not a lot of actors can do that now because no. everything is that like, you know, it's like watching, watching Ahsoka and everything is copy, 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 copy. It's like, when did mm -hmm. they talk like that in star Wars? Like, yeah, you guys think because you're crappy writers and you watched some generic war movie at some point, and everyone's on the radio going, copy, copy, copy. Like, who says right. that? No one says that. <laughs> Nobody. You know, and in the original Star Wars trilogy, so many times, they, you know, they would talk into a comm link or into, like, their mm -hmm. comms and their fighter, and you would just see them go. They would yeah. just make a face. Right. They wouldn't even acknowledge them. And I'm like, no. 
just shut up. Like yeah. you don't have to say copy every two seconds. It's because they. It's because not only do they not understand the franchise that they're working on, they also just don't understand how the real world works. Like right. a lot of them, right. I have a segment in my upcoming Indiana Jones review where I talk about the the one bullwhip scene in the movie. That's not. It's not that little moment on the train in the beginning. It's it's in that room on the in the hotel with right. the, the the boardroom table. At the table. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, there is no way that anybody who knows how a whip works, they would have all known, you cannot do that with a whip in a confined space like that. That is not possible. That right, right there is a digital, it's a digital effect uh, from people who conceived it, who probably never handled a bull whip before. And, you know, back in the day, if we go way back, filmmakers had lives before filmmaking. They were either war veterans or refugees or or they were, you know, the sons of poor cobblers or whatever. And they, you know, they lived a life before they so they had a point of view. They had experiences. Yeah. And then if you get even if you go all the way up to the first film school generation, as much as I have mixed feelings about people like Lucas and Spielberg today in retrospect through, you know, looking back on on their history, I won't go into that here. Um Early on in their careers, they were still ravenously curious, even if they grew up on television and movies and not really had a life of their own. You know, they were right. the first film school generation, yeah. but they were hungry for things. So when you see behind the scenes footage of them, you see them like wanting to get with the the arm the arms guy on the set and you know fire some of the weapons just to see how they operate. And yeah. you see them talking about what they you see them in the background watching Harrison Ford train with the whip or you see them wanting to learn how to, you know, fly up in an airplane to see how it feels so that they know how they want to shoot the shots, you know, for that scene in that movie or whatever. Like you, you have this curiosity and I don't think, I don't think that modern Hollywood has that curiosity anymore. And, And I think it bleeds over into toy design as well. I think they, they all just kind of think to themselves, I've got an imagination and I grew up in a time where they said everybody was special and I'm I've I know a lot of movies, and thanks to people like Kevin Smith, movie making is just referencing other movies. So that's what I'm gonna do, <laughs> yeah. and it's gonna be great. And it's like, yeah. no, mm, no, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's where things like Lucas and American Graffiti is done well because Lucas was a drag racer. And right, you right. look at Mario Puzo wrote The Godfather, and then you have Francis Ford Coppola, he comes from a very strict Italian American background, yes. like so he understood. All of the underlying subtle stuff that was going on in The Godfather, like, you know, why is this guy in the room? He's not Italian. Get out of the room. Like when Sonny's right. saying you got to go, like you can see they put a lot of emphasis on Sonny telling him to leave the room. Yes. You know, and that kind of stuff that they they understand those things. And a lot of these people who make military based toy lines wink, if we know what I'm talking about, Yeah, you know, and they they make a breech block shotgun that has a pump action on it, you know, for <laughs> Flint. I, and, I, and I know our friends have talked about that to death and we all laugh about it, but it's, it's not just about Flint's shotgun and classified. It's also everyone saying copy in star Wars. And I right. have seen throughout my military career. And I know you're like a big mm-hmm. military history guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have seen throughout my entire career where I'll get a new soldier and they think like, well, I'm in the army now and I'm in the infantry and soldiers are cool and they do cool soldier stuff. So I have to do some things that are radically outside of what I would normally do because I have to live up to being this soldier idea that's in my head. And you see these writers of shows and movies and you see these designers of of toy lines. And I don't necessarily believe that GI Joe has to be specifically military based, right? Special mission force. You had adventure team. They can do all sorts of things, but they they just want to do a real American hero to death and they never want to branch out. Yeah, I, I, I was telling somebody a few weeks ago, um, I had never seen any of the Mission Impossible films beyond part two. I, I just- Oh, they I, get so much better. Yeah, you, you, yeah right. <laughs> I'm so glad that I can read your sarcasm because I was like, at first I was like, for 0.3 <laughs> milliseconds, I was like, he can't be serious. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I had the same reaction. Um, but I, I I watched part three and I knew it was an Abrams film going in, so I knew I was going to be like, Oh, oh yeah, this is, yeah, I'm, yeah. This film already has a handicap for me. Lens like, flares. Yeah, yeah, lens <laughs> flares. But the other thing that I noticed immediately right off the bat was, I'm like, 
to your point about the classified team and how they just think they understand military and tactical and all that kind of stuff. I was like, oh, I can already tell what's going on here. This is what, 2005, eight, something like that when this movie came out. And I'm like, uh, JJ Abrams clearly, I told my friend this and he laughed. I said, JJ uh, Abrams clearly went into this script having binge played hours and hours of Metal Gear Solid Snake. And that's yeah. what he decided. Yeah, was realistic. I was waiting for Tom Cruise to turn into a cardboard cardboard box. box yeah, <laughs> like I was just I was like, what the you know, like, and again, like I know that Mission Impossible is not GI Joe, like it's, but it is fictional. Um, it's in the story. vein, yeah. Impossible yeah, Mission Force. Yeah, sure. fictional paramilitary action. You yep. know, like, and so it, I was I was looking at that and going, oh God, GI Joe classifieds this. They've been the video game generation has been has finally moved into a place where it's calling the shots, so to speak, yeah. on our on our military fiction. Yep. And that is that is scary. Like I, you know. Um Michael, uh Scuba Pete's here. Oh, Scuba. Good to see you, sir. Yeah, it's good to see Scuba. And um V Conley sends a dollar ninety nine super chat. Thank you very much and says, just want to support the channel. I really appreciate that. Thank you. V Connolly is good people. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and then Largo's Lair, good old Jim, says, G.I. Joe Resolute attempted to, that is not the, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to press buttons and read. Uh, Resolute attempted to address the Snake Eye Storm Shadow saga. Warren Ellis understood the assignment. Yep. Mm. I yep. I thought Resolute was brilliant because it tied in aspects of the Sunbow stuff. It tied in aspects of the, the Marvel comic stuff. Like you could see she had a relationship with Snake Eyes, but. She also had a relationship with Duke and, you know, are you going with him? Mm -hmm. Are you staying with me? And right. I love resolute resolute was like, um, why do I keep, I'm sorry, Jeff, <laughs> I keep doing that. Resolute was like uh wrath of con, you know, yeah. where they, they understood left and right limits. They understood mm -hmm. like, okay, well I, I get the basic principles of these characters, but I'm going to do something fresh. Yes. It's, it, it's a, a healthy irreverence for yes. us. Not they, they, you need somebody who, understands the mythology and understands why the these stories work like okay. they can look at it parse it and go ah i understand right why, why this resonates with people but now i'm going to be respectfully unorthodox in my yes. approach right respectfully right killing yeah. spock but respecting that right that long standing relationship between spock and kirk i got it. when I got abrams it. tried to do it oh there was no emotional like investment or value or payoff or anything. And the Spock yelling, Oh God, that movie is just bad. Oh dude. But, but he did the same <laughs> thing with Han Solo and then Ryan yeah. Johnson did it with Luke. And then, and I walked out of force awakens telling Melinda, I said, this is going to be a series of snuff films. And yep. she was like, what do you mean? I said, they're going to kill Luke in the next one. They're going to kill Leia in the last one. You mark no my way. words. And she was like, oh, you know, she she didn't like the movie, but she was like, oh. and sure enough, and I'm not saying I'm a sage, J.J. Abrams is very transparent and he's yeah. very shallow. You can oh, yeah. read him like a book, yep. um, even though that book's pages have no writing on them, but you yeah. can read him like a book. It's like that Sesame Street Grover book. When I'll tell you, when, um, when Last Jedi came out and he chucks that lightsaber, mm -hmm. I gave my wife, the slowest stink eye head turn that I possibly could. And I was like, what the f <laughs> was that? And she's like, just, you know, just, just, just watch, just watch. And then there was another part later on and it, I just kept getting louder. What's that? What, right. what, what, what the hold on maneuver. And I was <laughs> just losing. I, Wait, dude, I running was, out of fuel. This whole movie's about running out of fuel. I respect you for getting through it. Uh, Melinda, Melinda's really good at getting through movies. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get through it. So I never, I never like, I scrubbed through it. Yeah. But, but like Melinda was like, I'm going to try and sit down and watch this. And I was like, okay, well I'll be in the other room editing. And she came, she came in after like 32 minutes. She was like, I can't, I just, this, this film is so bad. I was like, yeah. there you go. We were, we were deployed from Thanksgiving 2019 through almost the end of 2020. So we missed the whole mm hmm Toilet paper, Clorox wipes, craziness. We missed yep. all of that. We missed, right. thankfully. But we also missed uh, the rise of Palpatine. And one of our Joes went to Kuwait, and he came back just before Christmas. He's like, hey, I got a bootleg copy of Star Wars Episode Nine. if you guys want to watch it. 
And so we all sat in our in our talk in our tactical operations center on Christmas Eve uh-huh. with the lights off, and we watched it. And I was like, "This movie is crap." Like, <laughs> yeah, we're in the war. And I'm like, "Nope, nope, nope, <laughs> not gonna do it." Uh, Johnny from Simple Tricks and Nonsense. We're going back to Snake mm. Eyes a little bit. Uh, Snake Eyes should have been white for the fish out of water scenario and mute who uses sign language to communicate, sacrifice the Asian box for the disability box. That my, my whole point with that is that that right there is, is showing an understanding of how the original mythology played out. Yep. When I, I had to write a Voltron screenplay years back, I, long story. I used to be the admin, the social media admin for uh world events productions. Um, while I was, my channel got started and, nice. um, and, uh, they had me read the live action screenplays for the, all the, the Voltron productions that they'd passed on. And, um, and Melinda said, cause I was just reading them and I, I couldn't believe how bad they were. I was glad they got passed on, but I couldn't believe it. Cause that's what I did in Hollywood was I, I, uh, was a, um, development guy where I would read scripts and then I got really good at reading scripts like real fast and writing yeah. coverage. And so I was like, these scripts are really bad. And, and, um, Melinda said, well, you know, you know, the old adage, you know, if you want to present them with a solution, give them a solution. I'm like, well, I'm not a hired writer for them for this project. So just do it anyway. Yeah. So I so I wrote I wrote this whole thing, and the reason I bring this up is it's not a it's not a shoehorn. Um, they I knew what their parameters were and what they were hoping to achieve with starting a a movie franchise. It was like right. they wanted it was back during the whole Marvel was gearing up and they were doing gangbusters, and so they wanted to right. set up a multi-pronged cinematic universe and all that kind of stuff. Well, I knew the Voltron mythology inside and out and go sure. lion and all that stuff. So what the, the reason I say this is when I was defining the characters, I knew that the five pilots were going to be subjected to a kind of panel of scrutiny by any Hollywood boardroom. Yeah, so to the, the whole DEI thing. Yeah. Yes. Right. So what I, what I felt was appropriate was, you you have to the, the the problem in nerd culture and geek culture right now is that the people who are mad about the stuff that's going on they're i don't think they realize they're more mad at the ineptitude of the execution than they are at the actual changes and so they they push back some of the changes are bad don't get me wrong some of the changes are right. horrible but but a lot of them are would be would be serviceable if the writing and the management of the producers was more competent, right? So they, so instead what geek culture does is it says all or nothing. I, if, if I don't get everything exactly the way I, I want it, then I hate all of it. And it's like, well, sometimes we've all done this in corporate jobs or in jobs with bosses who are, you, you want to get something through their filter. So you break something obvious over here that they'll notice so that this other thing goes through, right? right? So like, because because my goal was get the concept through intact. In other words, get the whole story through with the proper mythology. In other words, don't make them suddenly say, well, what we really want is for the, the lions to be, you know, terriers or something like that. Like sure, you didn't want yeah. that to happen. So you gotta, yeah. you gotta change something over here. And sometimes that implies or necessitates not breaking something, but adding something here so that they don't go looking for something to change over here. Right. right? Yeah. Your redirection. Exactly. Yeah. So when I did the script for, uh, for, for that, the five pilots, right. I was like, okay, well, and technically six, because you're setting up the idea that the princess will become a pilot. So you, you had know, spent. Right? right. Oh, absolutely. You can't yeah. not. Yeah. Um, so, I said, okay, look, I said, Keith is definitely like his, his real, you know, they were all a variation of Japanese in the go lion, but they all look different. So you don't know if in, in the Japanese translation, when they watched it, some of those characters were of different ethnicities. You, you aren't really sure. So, right. but what I did was I looked at the, the visuals of them and I went, okay, Keith can definitely be a Japanese guy. Like he is a, he's Keith Kogane. He's a pilot. That's his thing. Lance, definitely the American guy. Like Lance is the, the white, wisecracking American yeah. guy. That's the who bro. he is. Yeah. Hunk, Hunk is either like South American or Polynesian, you know, like he is because of his look and everything. Yeah. He can definitely, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Princess is as she is. And I was like, 
Now, guys, are we really going to argue about Pidge because he needs to be changed up to something? Because nobody knows what he is. Like yeah. everybody's like, yeah. he's got he's got a sailor suit on with like cowboy fringe. He's yeah. got a and, hair. And the new animated, yeah, they changed up Pidge. Yeah, right. So I was like, I said, okay, this is where this is where you you bend a little bit for the sake of the success of the production and also right. bringing the whole thing together. So I said, Pidge is is definitely uh right for you know alteration and so i i told i i wrote in that pidge was a he's still the youngest of the group he's a genius in research and development uh for the military uh uh what do you call that mecca program and uh he is an african-american kid and his name is anthony pigeon the third like in other so so they start snarkily lance and and hunk start calling him pidge to to Josh. Yeah, right. So, so his name's Anthony Pigeon the third, like Walter Pigeon, the, the movie star. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so and he's got, you know, the, the glasses with the, you know, the thing and everything, but they're like futuristic glasses, you know, and stuff. And when I sent it through, like, they were like, Oh, I love the roster on this. I love this. Like, this is, you know, we don't have to come back and ask you, Oh, can you like, you know, maybe like make concessions. Or you got to check another box there, Michael. It, yeah. It, it, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the whole thing. It's like, it's, that that's where you that's where a lot of nerd culture needs to sit back and be like okay what battles do we what do we want to win the war or do we want to just constantly fight battles right. yeah and, yeah and i'm not gonna, gonna die on every hill. Or not? yeah so yeah it's it makes perfect sense and that's that's kind of one of the i don't want to say frustrating things but that's one of the the good things about joe is joe mm -hmm. has always been diverse right so oh yeah <laughs> The most, like the most organically diverse a property of the 80s for any, yep. I mean. Kids. And it was organically diverse. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's and why then, I couldn't believe it with that first movie where it's like, we're, we're going to make this guy ripcord. And I'm like, where's Stalker? Where's Stalker? <laughs> like, and then there's, yeah. they, they tried to say, oh, well, Stalker uh, is kind of a problematic term right now. And I'm like, no. I said, first of all, if that was the case, he would still be the character of Lonzo Wilkinson. But he's not. You've literally just made him this nothing burger of a yeah. character, which is an insult to everybody. Like that's you know you've you have succeeded in slapping everybody in the face. Congratulations! Like yeah, some some writer had uh, had you know the Sunbow series on in the background mm -hmm. as they were trying to figure something out. You know, and they hear that ripcord pull your shoot. He's like, oh, we're gonna make that guy ripcord. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And then uh, Dem Gut says, Expendables is a better Joe movie. Just follow the blueprint. Hmm. That's true. That's Are you going to see Expendables four? Uh, we well, Melinda being a huge Stallone fan, I'm sure we will. Uh, we have Expendables one through three on 4K. So, yep, very cool. Um, here's something, and I almost mm -hmm. Matt Rubin brought it up, so I started, mm -hmm. and I was going to bring it up when we were talking about the corporate types, and everybody wants to be like some media company. Yep. Uh, if you guys want to talk about big bosses not being let go, so I think we're is this Cox or this is a guy before Cox? that bought E1 Entertainment and did nothing with it? Oh, no, this is the guy before Cox who died of cancer. Yeah, he, yeah. he had this obsession with, um, he, he it, I, did a video one, I did a video one time where I talked about the fact that, I, I used the phrase, I want to dance. Like he was, <laughs> yeah, uh, I want to dance. He, he, he didn't seem to want to run a toy, entertain, uh, toy products company. He wanted to be a movie studio. And so I was like, you know, I said at the time, I'm like, they're they're wanting to be a movie studio. They don't want to be a toy company anymore. Their 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 focus is completely pulled away. They're they're starting to call themselves Hasbro Gaming and all this kind of stuff. Like they're, and I knew at the time it was a bad move. It was like who who moves away from their core product offering, their core competitive differentiator to go do something that's already an established industry over here. And it's not like they were trying to do it like A twenty four has done it, where it's independent, innovative, edgy filmmaking like. He's not, he's trying to be another Disney, another Paramount, another uh, Warner Brothers. He wasn't yep. trying to be something different. Yeah. And I'm like, this is never going to fly. And so when he passed away, they, uh, you know, they immediately had this new guy, Chris Cox, come in. And, and while I have no love lost on him, because he's just another, you know, corporate suit, yep. Yep. he was, he was like, yeah, this isn't working. We're going to sell it off in a fire sale and bye bye. You know, and it was funny because when the guy died and everything like that, of course, 
they do this PR spin where they're like, oh, we're always going to honor his legacy and everything he did for the company, blah, 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 blah. Shit, there's no, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no heart there. There's no soul there. You know, that's oh. just because they, they, they know that the news cycle has no memory. And so they're like, they'll remember this for five minutes. It's on the record. And now can that crap, you know, and, and, and it's embarrassing for Hasbro, but it, it's kind of like Disney with the Fox purchase of $71 billion to buy Fox that yeah. Hasbro's E1 is Disney's Fox purchase, you know, like yep. it's, you know, and with that Hulu, I guess, by extension. So, yeah. Oh God, the Hulu thing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jeremy Kerr says white wisecrack an American guy. That's me. It is him. I've met him in person. That's definitely him. And that's, you know, so they have that new Joe game coming out next year, that Wrath of Cobra. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the trailer for that? I have, yeah. So they have this side scroller coming out, which I, I think is cool. We're doing sprites, we're doing side scrolling because yeah. uh the, the other game they just put out didn't didn't fly. No. So they're like, we're gonna go back to basics, side scrolling sprites. You know, it's a freaking yep. beat em up, yeah, couch co-op, way to go. Okay, I'm all on board with that. Then I watch the trailer, mm. and it's like just enough american animation with just enough of like the japanese like the hard yep. cuts that they do you know where you would see in like the robotech kind of stuff yes i know mm -hmm. it was called robotech but <laughs> you know you see that stuff and i'm like i'm watching this trailer why can you not make a gi joe cartoon with that animation right it would go gangbusters and yes like, now or yeah. even a or even a feature film with that animation that would be awesome like, oh so good bring something like that back. You know, I, what was it? It was, um, well, I've said this for a, a number of properties, like when Firefly got canceled and then it was years later. And I said, they should just bring back Firefly as animation so that the, the actors can do their voices, but you don't have to worry about them looking older or anything right. like that and do it really cool. Or when that guy, that, that, that art student did that amazing, um, X-wing tie or the tie fighter. Yes. Pilot, that whole anime the Japanese like, anime. Why can't they do a Star Wars movie like this? That like, would be so good. But but that's the after we saw how inept that group was when they greenlit a Rogue Squadron film. I panicked because we were that many years in, and I thought they're going to ruin Rogue Squadron. We I, I hope to God it never happens. And sure enough, it you know died. Oh, so. Rogue Squadron. You know, so that, yeah, they they did the reveal, and Patty Jenkins is getting into or out of the X wing. I can't remember. I just remember her with the helmet and an X wing. Mm -hmm. and she was talking about like her family and her lineage with you know pilots and i was like i was so torn mm -hmm. because i'm like i've seen patty jenkins do good stuff and i've seen wonder woman 1984 Ooh. and i don't know if kennedy and her people again like your example with the voltron mm -hmm. script i don't know if they would let her stuff kind of sieve through right to be good because every time you watch a warner brothers movie let me back up. Every time you watch a DC movie, you uh -huh. see the Warner Brothers people metal. Yes. You know, you got the guy who did Training Day and mm -hmm. Fury, and he does a Suicide Squad movie. And I'm like, David Error, that's a layup. That's that's going to be a home run. And right. then you watch it, and some music video editor got a hold of it and chopped it up. And I'm like, that's not David Ayer. That's not David right. Ayer at all. That's not even his style. And on and on and on because Warner Brothers can't not meddle. Mm -hmm. I I was so torn with the whole Patty Jenkins thing. And uh, there was something else I wanted to throw up for you. Uh, and while you're finding it, I would I would say that that also um, equates to Rogue One. I've I'm of the firm belief that even though Rogue One wasn't totally compromised by the corporate meddling. I firmly believe that Gareth Edwards' original concept for Rogue One is in the vaults and it is better because we saw enough footage yes. to run up to it. I There was a Star Wars war film there and yeah. they, got, they got scared and they backed off of it. And you can see, I 100% I agree with you because you can see the pieces of, mm -hmm. there. there is the foundation of a gritty war movie in there. Everybody's yeah. dirty. Mm-hmm when they fire those weapons you see the recoil like and that's going yep. back to empire strikes back type yep. recoil where they put blanks in those e11s and they yeah. were actually kicking yes you know and there was no one was safe you know right. and and i know there's a version of rogue one out there that is just yeah you know dirty dozen on scarif 
Me too. Like that, I, I would kill to see it. It's too bad Disney's hubris will never let it out of the vault. Like yeah. they put deleted scenes on all the saga films, the sequel trilogy. They didn't put any deleted scenes or even a commentary from Gareth Edwards on Rogue One, and he played nice with them. Yeah. So it's like, uh, it, it wow. was Tony Gilroy, right? Who they brought in? Tony Gilroy. They brought in for the reshoots, and Tony yeah. Gilroy is a whole. Like he's he's like yeah. I know that everybody loves Andor and all that stuff, but go back and go back and read some interviews about the kind of crap he pulled on the Born trilogy as the writer. Like it is, it's yeah. next level, and you'll sit there and be like, oh, now I can understand why Tony Gilroy's made the snarky statements he has, like dunking on Gareth Edwards without provocation and and everything like that. He's just kind of, I don't I eh, like I I. Mm. Tony Gilroy is riding on Gareth Edwards' coattails with Rogue One to do yep. Andor. He's taken a lot of credit for stuff that he really shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, Chronically Online, uh, this this one's for you. It says, hopefully that Ray movie never comes out. Arr. Yeah. And also, you know, it should be noted that in the re the reshoots of Rogue One, Gareth Edwards was involved because he did not pull a, a Josh Trank or anything like that. He was very cooperative. Yeah, he, he was. the guy that came up with the Darth Vader hallway scene. So, yeah, and that was last minute too, yeah, right? They were last like, minute. We, we need some kind of, mm -hmm. we need to spice up the end. And he's like, oh, well, let's just have Darth Vader like mangle everybody. Yeah, and 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 I'm sitting back going, if if that's the if that idea is coming out of that guy, I don't believe for a minute Tony Gilroy's statements that that movie was in trouble. I think that movie was reconceived by the yes. by the corporation. They got yes. scared, and suddenly the movie was in trouble because they couldn't edit that new concept together from the existing footage. They had to go back and reshoot. Yeah. And I think Tony Gilroy spun it in his statements. Yeah. I really wanted to watch that scene where they leave the bunker with the data tape and run under the ad at walkers. I yes. really wanted to see that scene. Yep. And then uh, Patrick says, Kennedy is great for announcing upcoming movies that never get made. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So um, I'm just making sure. I don't, oh yeah solo what'd you think of solo uh my buddy tim at the time forced me to watch it because tim is the guy that he's the guy that hates empire strikes back and um he loves attack of the clones he thinks it's the best star wars movie ever like i said i don't i don't hate people for their taste i do have to judge them quietly though and um he wanted me to watch solo i was like oh okay like i sure so i sat he brought the disc over or whatever or maybe he pulled it up on his disney plus and i sat down and and watched it um i thought it was very forgettable i thought it was um i didn't find it you know like it didn't offend my star wars senses in any great way yeah but i but i felt it was very dry and and very safe i thought it was very um it was too it was too safe and too predictable and um, I don't understand the muddy color palette the whole movie had. Like the whole experience was just boring. And, yeah. I, and it makes me want to see what the 85% finished Lord and Miller version was. I'd love to see what that would have been like. I mean, I couldn't you know. get past Alden Ehrenreich. Oh, yeah. They should have gotten uh, in Gruber, Anthony. Yeah, Gruber. because yeah. he can do a, a Harrison Ford. I just, it's just kind of one of those things. So, Disney's the black hole. I like the black hole. I really do. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's there's characters in the there's actors in the black hole where when I see them on screen, I'll, all I can think of is like, you know, mother, mother, yes. mother. <laughs> you know, well, like, I mean, because those were the those, those me out of it. Those were the players at the time, you know. Yeah. And Anthony Perkins was he was a victim of of his role as uh, the, the guy in psycho, he, yeah. he was a victim of instant typecasting because he did such a good job yeah. with, with that role. Um, it happened to a lot of people back then, you know, yeah. and I don't see it with Ernest Borgnine, even though like sometimes if I watch the black hole, I hear the airwolf theme at right at moments and you, you know, that's okay. I was spared from that because while I was watching Airwolf, I was also watching a lot of old war films with my dad and stuff. And Borgnine shows Borgnine, up yeah. of those. So yeah. like it, the his and Flight of the Phoenix with Jimmy Stewart, he's in that. And so like I was I was already acclimated to Borgnine as a as an actor in, in multiple roles. But I get what you're saying. Like if that's the only thing you'd seen him in, 
and then you see him in this, it's going to pull you out of it. Yeah. yeah. I, I like seeing Ernest Borgnine in red. You know, he's just kind of mm-hmm. shows up. He's, he's the archives guy. Right. You know, George Aiken makes a good point here. A Rogue Squadron movie would have a strong female character mm-hmm. and a stupid fellow male pilot who needs to be rescued. Well, that's that's Rogue Squadron movie under this regime, and that's yes. why I got that's why I got nervous because when they said Disney's buying Lucasfilm, I was not one of the people that was excited. But then, as I then as I uh, hoped against hope, I kind of was like, well, maybe if maybe if they make my dream project, which is a Rogue Squadron series of film, I thought it was going to be a series of films because I. Right. Love- x-wing tie fighter x-wing versus tie fighter all those pc sim games i was like if they do that maybe that'll at least be something i'll enjoy that comes out of this um but that was me just pie in the sky at the time they had not announced anything like that i actually thought that rogue one because of the trailer was going to be that i thought it was going to be because they the the teaser was like the death star in the sky over yavin and then these x-wings going by yeah i was like oh i was like oh cool this is going to be like the first yeah rogue movie i was like this is gonna be amazing and then it turned out it was about the spies or whatever but as time went on very rapidly i realized this regime is butchering star wars yeah so then when they announced rogue one i was like oh god please no like please don't touch that like just yeah. like with mara jade it's like please don't ever touch mara jade or rogue one or rogue squadron please don't yeah. please don't and, and you know it's widely known that Dennis Lawson did not want to come back to Star Wars. And, you know, it was like a wing and a prayer to get him back for that, like, hot minute in episode right. nine. But I don't want to see a Rogue Squadron without Wedge. Yeah. Who would? Yeah. I just I just don't want to see it. And, and, then, and uh, I'm, I'm one of those people that's – I don't mind recastings, like, as long as it's done well. Like, yeah. you know, uh, if Rogue Squadron was set right after Return of the Jedi, you've got to recast those parts. I, I get sick of people – in our generation acting like suddenly recasting isn't okay. When we grew up watching Bond get recast. I was just going to say James Bond. Yeah. yeah, Watching Superman get recast, watching Batman get recast. We have to, I find it laughable. I find it absolutely laughable that for years, for years uh, in the, on the message boards of Indiana Jones, but before uh, Crystal Skull came out and especially before five, yeah, all these people would just dogpile on me because I said, "I wish they'd just recast the role." And they're like, "What?" And they would say, "No, Indiana Jones is special." And I'm like, "In what universe?" I'm like, <laughs> "I can name like six different franchise characters that are far more successful as 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 IPs than Indiana yeah. Jones, and their character has been recast over and over again over the years. Maybe there's a correlation there." Right. And so, like, I, I went on a rant one time. Uh, this is before I ever had a channel about this. Uh, and, and I said, I said, dude, I was like, Superman, Batman, James Bond. I said, I said, Lara Croft. Uh, and then I and then I just snarkily was like, Jesus. I said, if you can recast <laughs> Jesus like eight times, I said, you're going to sit there and tell me you can recast Han Solo. You yep. can recast, you know, have different Luke Skywalkers. I said, and you're going to sit back and tell me that no, but indiana jones is the special one it's like yeah give me a break man like the- have you seen those comparison shots of sebastian stan next to mark hamill yeah it's it's insane right yeah i, I was like I, I never saw it until i saw them side by side with yeah. that like dude the I, early, I, I, early I, empire like yeah I, I, I did, a, I did a photo on my instagram one time where i popped the head off the the marvel legends uh sebastian stan um, Winter Soldier. Yeah. And I put it on my best Ben Luke Skywalker just to show people like, look at this. Yeah. And they were like, geez, you know, and I, it is a, it is a, it is a, a miscarriage of justice that they didn't immediately green light a Thrawn trilogy based on the original books with How good. How good. I mean, dude, like it's a, it's a slam dunk. If yeah. You, you got, you got the lost fleet and Thrawn and you got the Nogri or Nogri or however you want to pronounce that. Yeah. Um, just Jeff says that uh, I'm all about black holes. <laughs> hey, first of all, black hole is arguably not even arguably black hole is the most daring movie Disney ever made. Yep. W- uh, followed by Tron and black cauldron. Those yes. are the three most daring movies Disney ever made. Agreed. And, and so like, 
it, it black hole is a movie you can study like that's a movie where you can actually immerse yourself in what was going on with this like and that you can't do that with a lot of disney films yeah what's up ashton i see you i see everybody who's coming in and saying hi i I, I try to watch the chat and say hi. To I'm talking too me. much. That's what I'm describing. No, you're not talking. That's the whole point of having you here, man. So uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I'm going to tell a little funny story, Michael. Okay. So for anybody who doesn't know, uh, I'm going to paint this picture. So we're at we're at Joe Fest, right? Everybody's having a good old time at Joe Fest. And Scuba Pete was there too, right? So uh, he also agrees 100% recast Indian Let's Rock. So we're all at Joe Fest and uh, there's there's Scuba, there's, there's Michael, there's Melinda and there's me, and I'm just sitting at this one table waiting on my breakfast, and I keep seeing Melinda look at me, and then I look over at Melinda, and then I keep seeing Melinda look at me, and I look at Melinda, and I didn't know until later on that day when Melinda came up and told me, um, she leans over to Michael, and she's like, there's some guy over there, and he's staring at the back of your head, and I'm like, I'm not staring at you. You keep looking at me. <laughs> well, but the, that, that's the thing, because you and I know what each other look like. Yeah, so yeah, I, we know I knew, yeah, I knew who you were, so like, yeah. And we, I think we'd already talked. We'd yeah. already talked. Yeah, we don't. I think we met. Didn't we meet at the last? Or were you not at the last Joe Fest? No, last year. Yeah. No, I mean, sorry, two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. You, me, and my wife. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So I was like, so I knew I was, but she thought she thought you were, and I'm like, no, no, I know him. It's all, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, you're like that's Chad. <laughs> and later on, she comes like I passed her right um, at the end of the Valiverse panel, and I'd never talked to Melinda before. Mm -hmm. And I passed her and she's like, I have a funny story to tell you in a minute. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and, just, and so me, I stood there and I waited in mm -hmm. the same spot that I was in. Like I patiently waited. And then she walked up and she was like, so I thought you were like some Michael Pater stalker guy. And I was like, <laughs> no, no, it's just me. And she was like, yeah, I'm sorry. And then uh, Pete said, yeah, I waited three hours for that omelet. I, 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 I did wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. um, Oh, here you go. Recast indie, just not with Shia LaBeouf. All right, I'm not going to go on a full rant, but I am going to say this, JLS. Shia LaBeouf, while you might not want him to be Indiana Jones, which he he's he can't be at this point because he's a different character yeah, in the lineage yeah. of, of the story. Indiana Mutt. He is blameless for that movie. As a matter of fact, if you go back and study all the scenes that mm -hmm. he's in with other actors, you'll notice he's the only guy selling all the crazy BS that's happening around you at the time. Like... He's the only one that was able to try and plug in. And I feel so bad for him because he was the one that was tasked with shouldering the monkey swinging, which nobody could sell. There was nobody yeah. that could sell that. But yeah. if you're looking at all the other scenes where he's with other actors and he's delivering dialogue, look at the cringiest scenes in the movie, the sand pit scene, yep. the scene where they go over the waterfall three times and land. He's the only one that's credibly delivering his dialogue. He's the only, the, and I'm not saying the other people are bad actors. No, they're not. Karen Allen, right. Harrison Ford, they're great. But guess what? The script and the plot was so bizarre. Every 90% of actors would have a really hard time trying to figure yeah. out how to sell these clunky lines. Shia just, he just like nails it 95% of the time. Yeah, It's a testament to his ability. Like I, he's a weird dude, but he's yeah. really good actor. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. uh, so. I a hundred percent agree with you. Um, I love Fury. I love Fury. A lot of talented actors in Fury. That movie reestablished my faith in his acting skill. Yeah. He is, as Bible, he is so good in that movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Blue Serendipity, thank you for the $4.99 super chat, says Brendan Fraser, Fra Fraser would have been a great Indiana Jones, just my two cents. I, I saw somebody uh, earlier, they, they, they picked my choice, which was Bradley Cooper. Um, I, I've, oft, I've always thought that Bradley Cooper would have been good. Um, at you know, if we go back a few years, he would have been great. I, th yeah, I think this could probably... flying by. I'm I'm trying to keep. Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. No, I was just saying. Um, and you know, the somebody's talking about Chris Pratt. Um, but I I think he's overexposed at this point. And... Yeah, I I heard Pratt uh, thrown yeah. around for that, but I but I think once you get Pratt in like the Jurassic World thing, and he's mm -hmm. playing. A similar ish character. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's that's kind of it. That's kind of but it. now, but now he's he's gotten to the point where you just see Chris Pratt. Like you're not seeing like he's I don't I, know I don't even see Star Lord anymore. 
Right. I don't know what his character's name is in Jurassic Park. I just know him as Chris Pratt, the raptor guy. Like that's Owen? Is that what it is? I don't like, know. <laughs> yeah. There was like a question mark at the yeah. end of that. So Chronically says Japan has a sick black cauldron attraction and it's scary. Is that oh Disneyland, Japan? I think so. Disneyland Tokyo? I, I would really be interested in, in experiencing that. That sounds cool. I, I'll tell you what, Michael. Um, the kiddo and I just took a couple of days and we mm -hmm. went to Disneyland and it was horrible. And I love oh, Disneyland. Was it, it? It was just full of nothing but your local SoCal annual pass holder types. Right, right. Um, you know, you would just watch them like throw trash on the ground and um they they weren't really doing a good job cleaning up the park and oh, it's just man. a bunch of people it's just hundreds and hundreds of people walking like this like oh. you know they're they're not there for the experience or the the environment right. or the atmosphere it's like um i know you've been around right mm. have you ever been to the the pyramids at the giza plateau i wish i okay. wish i've never gotten to north africa I, i'd love to go so I went there mm -hmm. and it was it was an interesting experience the first time I went there. It was like 50% awe and 50% like shock and disgust because Yeah, because the city's so close. Well, not not only do you not know because everything on the history channel is all about camera angles, you don't know that the slums are literally right up to the Sphinx. Right. It's like 30 foot walls to keep them out. Oh. But as you're as you're walking around and there's all like the panhandlers and stuff and they'll take a shemog and they'll throw it on you and then they'll they'll like demand money and they'll follow you for like 20 minutes oh but my god you have people like locals and they're they're lying down in like the i don't want to call them tombs but in the temples that surround they're lying down inside they're like taking naps <laughs> um you see them like urinating like they'll, they'll climb up a little bit on on like the you know the the great pyramid like like khufus and they're just urinating oh and like they they do not appreciate like i'm at one of the ancient wonders of the world and it took right me forever to get here and a massive amount of money and they're just like meh I don't get well it sounds like times have really changed because you know when i read accounts of people who visited Back in the 80s and 90s, it was guards around the pyramids and yep. you did not climb on them. And, you know, it was you yeah. could be charged with doing that. You know, we we went to the Valley of the Kings mm -hmm. and uh, we went down into I don't want to try to say who's but one of the real big tombs. Right. Uh, not Tuts. Right. Because that's real small. Right. Also, the only one that's air conditioned. But we went into I, I want to say maybe one of the SETIs. Uh -huh. We went down into this tomb and, you know, you go down and then you're in a room and it's got a bunch of pillars and then you go down again. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get into this room and there's all these pillars and there's all these locals and they're just lying there. <laughs> they're lying there and they like wave at you. And I'm like, it smells like Doritos in here. Like, <laughs> like I don't want to be in here. Like, I want to experience this tomb. I, like, why are you waving at me? Who are you? Like, yeah, you're you're waiting to just see a slushy dispenser just sitting there. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, ah. and then. Yeah, Big Bacon says there's a KFC right across the street from the Sphinx. There is, yeah, that's true. That anyway, is, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get out of that topic. So, before we kind of wrap it up, I just I kind of wanna uh, massage our conversation back mm. toward toys. Um, sure. We already kind of talked about crowdfunding. Uh, you did an X Men video today, yeah. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you because you still like toys. I do still like toys. Yeah. Um, I, I like toys and I also like talking about toys objectively. Some people would say too harshly, but I do. Yeah. I, I like talking about toys objectively. Um, you know, and that's okay. So I guess that's where we're going to go here. So talking about toys objectively, mm -hmm. I always appreciate the observations where I can look at 82 to 94 objectively mm -hmm. and i can say you know what that's a that shitty dino hunters dinosaur that they chucked into that pack that's that dinosaur's terrible right you know it's like a it's like a pool squeak toy or something mm -hmm. but no one bats an eye right right now if i say that um the first classified lady j looks like phyllis diller or justin bieber you know, mm -hmm. then people just come 
like it's knives out, like they right. just come at you. And I've noticed more and more, the more you're objective about certain lines, mm -hmm. the more people, and I don't even understand finding offense to the stuff in the first place, because like you're choosing to be offended over a piece of plastic, which is weird. Right, right. But at the same time, it's almost like you can't accept my objective opinion because you almost need me to validate Mm -hmm. you know your need to make the purchase or something like that and so there's like this very thin skinned kind of yeah. uh, like a recoil response to oh my god you said something negative and so <laughs> the way that i always describe classified and i'm not a fan like everybody knows right the way that i always describe classified is it's, it's like some protected class of citizen that you can't you can't say anything negative and i got mm -hmm. into it started as an observation mm -hmm. in another friend's comment to the guy who sculpted um, the classified televiper. Right. And he was saying, when I sculpted that figure, the arms were always meant to be black. Uh-huh. And then he turned around and he completely contradicted that statement by saying he never saw the colorways. He was just told how to sculpt it. And I'm like, well, then how can you say the arms were always meant to be black? Because if you can only, and I'm, I'm air quoting, you can only get such detail in a 112 scale figure, which I completely disagree with because I have a lot of Eagle Force, you know, fresh monkey right. fiction stuff that has fantastic detail. Right. And you have not a single crease or weird ripstop pattern or anything from the sleeve roll that you you sculpted a sleeve roll on there mm -hmm. all the way down to the wrist. And you're trying to say those sleeves are always meant to be black. Like I understand if you just want to come back and say, look, the, the powers that be said, we want to pack more heads in there. So people buy them as army builders. So paint it black and say, it's a body suit. Okay. That's fine. But this, this whole like bullshitting a bullshitter kind of thing. Uh -huh. It's like, it just gets old. Yeah. And I, I don't understand this you know, that, that mentality of we can't be objective toward toys anymore. Well, there, the sad part is that those kind of statements defending this kind of stuff come from both yeah. the, the simps and from the PR spin toy people themselves. They always try and sell, you know, the gullible on, well, we did this this way because, you know, texture is expensive and it's like, no texture's free. Like, like, when you're doing a mold, texture is actually not. It's just, like, it's just a wave. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Wave. It's not, but they sell people on these false ideas that, well, remember, remember, if, like a year or two ago, it still gets thrown around. But the go to the go to term to uh, stop any debate about toy prices or toy quality or toy quality shortcomings or QC issues is tooling. Like, tooling, well, yeah. well, you know, the cost of tooling, well, you know, tooling, well, you know, tooling. Well, we got to keep tooling costs down. It's like, yeah, guess what? In this conversation, uh, I'm only seeing one tool and it's you saying tooling over and over again. Like, like you don't know what that is. You're just using that word because what the people on the late, the latest pulse stream said that a few times, like, yeah. you know, please, you know, and, and yes, Robert, in, Robert's infinite realms. It was you, um, yeah, and then I, I jumped in, but I, I didn't want to name drop you. But uh, I have those screenshots, too. I kept those as well. <laughs> but, yeah, Robert was like, hey, man, check this out. And I was like, oh, boy, I'm in on this. Mm -hmm. so, um, Yeah, the, the tooling thing. And what – how do you feel about this whole blasters thing, how they, they won't say – Oh. They say blasters. But, but they'll say spear gun. Right, of course. It's like if it if it's if it's if it's in their minds meant to like kill a walrus, then they're okay saying it. But yeah. if it's but if it's meant to be used in combat, they I'm surprised they just aren't saying pew pews at this yeah, point. Pew 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 pew. Like but yeah, I, it, it's that whole Transformer Star Wars mindset. Like now we're just they're all blasters, all of them. Yeah, I'm um I'm actually working on a video uh, that's. I'm planning on having it come out after I finally get over this Indy five thing. And it's, it's going to be about the, the sort of crazy history of Lara Croft's um, 
G U N S. And I do not mean her biceps. Like, I mean, like, you know, and it's a really, really cool, interesting story. And uh, based on everything that YouTube has revised with their, with their algorithm, they I've been told that it, it's actually an okay video to do. It, it won't necessarily get slapped down. It might get limited or something, but they won't like yeah. strike it off the platform. But, but the point in saying that is like, these toy companies, I think they've created their own reality when it comes to, and, and part of it has to do with companies like Disney pushing down on them with things like this. Uh, they they believe a false reality is out there where they can't just be straightforward about what they're making anymore. Yeah. And especially where military toys are concerned. And it's, it's very weird. Remember, G.I. Joe went Toys R Us exclusive for a while before it died and, and disappeared for a long time because they said, oh, military toys don't sell. And it's like, meanwhile, the same Toys R Us's were selling these amazing... Um, what were those that series called? It was from uh, twenty. True Hero Sentinel. What's that? True Hero Sentinel. True Heroes. Yes, thank you. Yeah. That those amazing battle sets and the vehicles yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And I that mean, giant ass C one thirty back there. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And mm -hmm. and some of the amazing fighter jets and stuff they were making and things like that. They were they were being sold in quantity, you know, at the same time that GI Joe was dying because military toys are problematic yeah. now and all yeah. this. Stuff. And that again, that was that were right there. You could see, okay, this is what Hasbro's saying, but clearly other toy companies are having no problem with this, and the people who are the buying public do not have a problem with this. Nope. So so Hasbro is creating its own discomfort. It's yeah. creating its own issue. Um, they did the same thing and have done the same thing because of uh Disney's directives with um the marvel uh, mcu figures where some black widows have twin pistols other black widows did not come with ones you know like the and and, and some of them were mcfarland yes yep like they're glued in the holsters sometimes and sometimes yep. they're not even there yep. sometimes it just comes with, with sticks like it's this whole thing and you sit back and you say well is this really an issue and i and i think back to the famous story that George Lucas told in 1977 when Kenner picked up the Star Wars line late in the game um, and they were trying to get everything ramped up. Yeah. And they came to him early on in the development process and showed him the first wave of 12 figures that they'd proposed. And his first comment was, where are the guns? Yeah. And and we'll say blasters. Sorry, everybody. And um, where's the pew pew? Yeah. Well, he said G U N S. Yeah. And, and they said, oh well, we thought you know with the uh, recent uh, ending of the Vietnam War and you know emotions being what they are, you know we just thought it'd be best to just leave them out. And he right. went, so where are the you know like he just he just asked it again. And so yeah. that's that's when they where's, where's 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 the guns? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because. <laughs> He's like, have you seen the movie? Like, it's about action. It's about adventure. It's about people, you know, yep. pew, pew, pew. And Star Wars. Wars. Mm -hmm. Star Wars. Yeah. And so they went back and they added in the accessories. They had to they had to mock those up. I think the only accessories that they had were lightsabers and then, like, the sticks for the, yeah, the sand yeah. people. Yeah. Um, and he was like, this is pointless. Like, you can't. Um, again, it's a company going up its own rear end and setting up this idea in its head of what reality is out there. Yeah. yeah. When in That's truth... It's that's what happens when you get committee creativity. Yep. You get one person who's uncomfortable and then the telephone game happens where they go, yeah, well, I've heard, you know, that the tenor out there is that the tenor out where. Yeah. Well, the, the two best examples of that are Lorenzo de Bonaventura and the hooded Cobra commander fiasco BS. And mm -hmm. what Disney Lucasfilm does with lightsabers now mm -hmm. where, you know, you can run anybody through and they're, you know, they're up and dancing two minutes later. No one loses limbs anymore. That used to be like a staple of Star Wars. Like, oh, right. you're going to lose a hand. Right. But now it's just not a thing. It's just, we'll just stab them in the gut and they'll be fine mm -hmm. next episode. It's okay. And like, like no one, no one dies. Everything's a gotcha. It's like, oh, you got ran through. And you know, Qui-Gon Jinn's pissed. You know, right. Because yeah. he died. Of course. Nobody else yeah. can. No, nobody else can. Darth Maul can come back after being cut in half. Yeah. But Qui-Gon Jinn could not be saved. But that, that whole thing, even the, even the prequels had their share of non-lightsaber weaponry for people. Yeah. Ranged, you know, sidearm and, and, and rifles yeah. and stuff. 
and and that's part of fantasy adventure. That's part of the understood fiction of it all. Yeah. And, and Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, exactly. And and uh, even things that come closer to home, like GI Joe and, and other things like that. I think it's a disservice to. I think it's a disservice to play patterns, and it's also a disservice to the collective uh, intelligence and understanding of yeah, you know, our society. Like uh, Big Bacon says here that Deadpool had glued in holsters. Yes, he did. The interesting part about that, though, is that they did not mold it all as one piece. You can actually just pull real hard straight up, and the and the guns come out. <laughs> so. I I haven't seen that comment yet because I was hovering over roll keepers. It's like I can't respect your opinion because your opinion is wrong. Right. I love I love that mentality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's insane to think like, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, Patrick Strelko says, God bless you. Retro bless you. <laughs> I, I'm a, I'm of the, 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 my motivation to do videos is always about what's, what's a, what's a cool story that maybe people haven't heard. What is, and I'm not trying to talk myself up. All of us as content creators are trying to engage our, 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 our fellow collectors with interesting stories to tell. Yeah. And for me, I can't leave a good story lying on the ground, especially if there's opportunity for comedy, if there's opportunity for laughs, if there's opportunity for leaning forward and going, wow, you know, like one of the things that I tried to to do, and I've only been moderately successful at it on my George channel. George saying good night. Oh, good night, George. Have a good one. Right. Um, right. Go ahead. The, one of the things I tried to do, and I've only been moderately successful at it, is is show people that curiosity is what's the most important. It's yep. not it's not staying in a lane and only just re constantly revisiting what you know. It doesn't mean that to be curious about something doesn't mean you have to spend money to collect it. It just means you expand your knowledge base, right? Yep. So I, I've told this story a few times, but I'm just going to say it again because it bears repeating. People thought when I did that Spice Girls video, they thought that I was revealing that I was some kind of closeted Spice Girls collector. And I was like, whoa, guys, I'm like, first of all, I'm, I'm not going to take offense to anybody who is a Spice Girls collector. I, I judge no one. Um, life, life is too short and life is too hard to not have something to enjoy. Yep. Um, what I thought was tragic about that is that they missed the whole point of the video, which was. I, I went into a toy store. I was talking with the owners. We were laughing and cutting up. They had just bought a doll collection. They bought it for a certain number of dolls but they, that they knew would sell, but they had to buy the whole collection. And they had all these other dolls, all kinds of dolls in there, like all still in the boxes. They didn't know how they were going to get rid of them. And there were all these Spice Girls dolls in there. And I was like, oh, I remember those from when I worked at Toys R Us. Like I used to have to straighten them up, you know, on the aisle when I would clean up at night. And I, I went home. And I just kind of tapped around the internet and started to figure out that, oh, wow, that was Galoob. They had this many waves. And then Hasbro bought Galoob while this toy line was in in service or in, in production. Yeah. And it didn't get killed off when Hasbro took over, which is shocking because a lot of times they just cut off. Kill it. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, wow, this must have been really popular. And so I looked into it more and I went down a rabbit hole and I was like, man, this is really interesting. So yeah. I went back and I told the guy, hey, I said, I know you got a lot of dolls. You don't know what you're going to do with. I'll take the Spice Girls dolls. And he's like, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they, you know, so I took them, filled in a few gaps, made the video. And everybody, instead of getting curious about, and, and a lot of people did, don't get me wrong. A lot of people really did engage with the video. And they're like, wow, that really yeah. is interesting. Like, that's a really interesting story. And I'm like, yeah, right. A good toy story is out there. Like yeah, even, even the, Viper Scout says that Spice Girls video was great. And I agree. Yeah, thank you. It, it's it's not about like, I think some people watch these videos and go on all of our channels. They watch these videos and just assume that we're trying to sell them on something. And it's like, yeah. no, I'm not trying to get you to go out and become a Spice Girls collector. I wasn't and still am not one. But I found a really interesting story. And I had to tell everybody like, this is worth, you know, just kind of sinking into for 20 minutes. Yeah. And and that's my whole point is that I think we need to as a community when we were kids and the toy aisles were filled with all these different options. We were curious about all these different lines. It was yeah. like it wasn't just GI Joe all the time or Transformers. We would get curious about 
what's this in humanoids thing? And Ooh, what's this, uh, what's this, uh, visionaries thing over here? And what's the, what's this Christar thing? And what's this thing coming out? You know, like I, I we, we had cops. Yeah. cops. Yeah. Like there were so many options from so many different companies that we were able, like what's, what's supernaturals. Like we might've only been interested in it for a biscuit minute, but yeah. we looked into it, you know? Yeah. And I think as collectors, as adults, we've gotten very pedantic and we've lost that curiosity. Yeah. And so now we just stay in these lanes and we just think that we, and I'm like, I'm exploring Playmobil for the first time. I'm, I, I bought some Spice Girls dolls just to get the story, just to get the scoop. You know, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking my first foray, major foray into vintage Power Rangers to see what that was all about because I was in high school. I was out of toys at that point. Yeah. I'm trying to stay curious about this stuff. Yeah. And a lot of our brethren have gotten stuck and it, it's, it's, it's kind of, I think it's why we see so much, you know, Groundhog Day in what's being offered. Yeah. It's just like, how many, how many versions of the four turtles can we keep buying? Yep. That's, uh, I was just going to say the same thing. Like, I don't, I don't care to learn anything about like uh exo squad or mask. Just give me another shipwreck. You know? Right. It's, it's yeah. just the same thing. Yeah. It's, it, it, it is. And, it, and it's too bad because it, like I said, even if you don't end up collecting any of this stuff, just being curious about what it was all about. Yeah. Helps broaden your knowledge of the whole toy history. And I would think, that everybody in this space would have some modicum of interest in learning the broader history, the broader canvas of where we all operate. And, and, but you know, no, I, I completely agree with you. I don't, I don't collect superpowers, anything, Batman, anything, Marvel, really anything, Star Wars. I, I have a couple Star Wars pieces that I've made, you know, customs mm -hmm. out of and things like that. Um, Ninja Turtles, mm -hmm freaking uh voltron but yeah. I, I know stuff about all of these things yeah, yeah. oh I, I totally forgot to answer your question about the voltron i got sidetracked you were saying when you asked that question all that time ago you were saying why do they keep you know making like the same thing or whatever you said when is voltron going to break out or something like that when are they going to do something different or no or like something? yeah well when's 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 that voltron going to be enough it was yeah it yeah was when's that voltron going to be enough and that totally dovetails with what we're saying right now which is yeah. you know i the the whole Voltron thing, the only the only thing I see of when it's going to be enough is when it just becomes too expensive to buy the next one. And that's yeah. sad. It's it's sad when Voltron's not reinventing itself. It's just getting more expensive with each iteration. Yep. And you can say the same thing about, I mean, look at that missing link Optimus Prime they've announced. Like it's a $120 vintage Optimus with a few more elbow joints or something yeah, like it. Even all the masterpieces, it's like MP10, MP44. Here comes another one. Watch out. And they're like, yeah, I have an MP10. And I'm like, that's good. I'm good. I'm yeah, good with I'm fine right with that. Like, yeah. it's it's good. We're good. Like, it. There, there comes this point where, you know, back when we had stamps, you know, like, you know, for your passport, whatever, you had the stamp plate, the 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 ink pad, right? Yeah. You had the, and eventually that ink pad would dry out and the stamps would start to get sh shallower and harder to read. Yep. That's what a lot of these franchises are starting to look like. Yeah. They're just they're just a stamp pad that has been used up beyond its expiration date. And it's another good analogy. Yeah, like we need time for these things to you know, go into hibernation for a little while. Get some energy built up behind them. Let that let that, you know, carbonation build up behind that cork a little bit so that it yeah. You know, it, it, it can, you know, Batman, Superman, all this kind of stuff. They need a rest. Like they, yeah. you know, like they, they still got Ben Affleck. And then they, they're like, here comes Robert Pattinson. And I'm yeah. like, we're, we're, what about yeah. Affleck? <laughs> what about <laughs> Affleck? And now they're saying there's going to be another Batman on top oh, of that. You God, know? Like, know. Yeah. Viper Scout's got a question for you. Do you still have the Spice Girl stuff? Uh, Yeah, because um, I can't, much like the toy, the toy store I got them from, I can't really see a way of effectively selling them yeah. because so they don't just says, says you're a pack rat. Well, no, I, I actually, I actually took three boxes, huge boxes. Sal help, from two cents toys helped me out when he was here. We took three huge boxes of stuff over to second chance toys and just handed it to him. I didn't want anything for it. I was just like, you know what? Take it. Cause I needed space, right? I I'd already done the videos or whatever. And I just needed the space. Um, so I'm not above doing that, but 
there comes a point where you you don't want to be the guy where they see you in the parking lot with the box and they're about to get saddled with stuff they can't move. Right. Yeah. I want to still be somebody that that toy store looks forward to seeing. And mm -hmm. and so with that Spice Girls stuff, it's like, well, I can't see myself flipping it on eBay. I could, dude, I couldn't even, this is like seven years ago, I couldn't even sell a complete run of Superman comics. And I mean all four titles plus all specials and everything from the Burn Crisis relaunch through 2007, unbroken on all titles, I could not move those comics to save my life. Like wow. there was nobody who was taking them. Like, and they were bagged, boarded. They were they were complete, a full run of every title. I finally had to give them away to one of the guys who was moving us just so I didn't have to carry them around anymore. So with the Spice Girls thing, it's not so much about being a pack rat. It's about knowing what's going to move quickly and what won't. Like I've got Lego sets that I'm going to flip at some point, like the Voltron and um, some of the Harry Potter stuff. And I know those will sell because the Lego community is rabid. They're like, yeah, you've oh, got yeah. the boxes, you've got everything, you know, bagged and stuff. We'll take it, you know, like whatever unused decal sheets. It's going to be great. But, but with the Spice Girls stuff that I got for basically pennies boxed, I know that ain't going to be easily flippable. Yeah. So I just kind of don't worry about it. Yeah. It's like, whatever. Maybe uh, somebody, you know. Yeah. Uh, so Adam from Go Figure and Paul Knapp just showed up. And Paul Knapp says, uh, I've been quietly watching. I don't want to go to YouTube jail again. <laughs> he, he got his channel, like, struck down for no reason. One, what? one of their little, you know, robot Terminator. Oh, God. You, you know what I mean? You know how that happened? Yeah. And they just said that he was doing something, like, unlawful or illegal. Mm -hmm. And they just canned his channel and he had to fight it. Oh, man. Yeah. That's yeah, it's, it's that's too crazy. bad. So we were talking about, you know, opinions and attitudes and how they change and things like that. And one of the last things that I, I, I really want to talk about with you specifically, mm -hmm. um, aside from the fact that I want to say I was glad that you put DV in your Stan Solo Rebel Fleet Trooper video. <laughs> it was nice to see him come back and use the force and yank him off the table. I, I enjoy the fact that, you know, you, as, mm -hmm. as well as a lot of our other friends and stuff, put put comedy and humor and try yeah. to have a good time in videos. Sure. Otherwise, it's just... Ugh. But, so when we talked about crowdfunding model, and uh -huh. do you remember originally the argument was, well, they have to be crowdfunded because stores won't stock these things. And then the argument was always, well, Mattel's getting Castle Grayskull on the shelf. You know, you could easily get classified his tank on the shelf, but right. it was no, but we have to crowdfund it. We have to crowdfund it. And then they they did the 118 scale Sky Striker. And I was like, why are you crowdfunding a Sky Striker? They just had a 30th anniversary Sky Striker. I mean, it just it wasn't right. like a month ago, but the 30th anniversary Sky Strikers were all over the place. And I'm still looking at Castle Grayskull in stores. So now we're starting to see, well, they're coming out with the vamp and they're coming out with the SMS and this and that. And do you think that that, um, that crowdfunding model argument holds any water anymore? I, I'm really just trying to set you up. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, I, the, is that vamp SMS? That's retail, right? That's yep. not, yeah. That's like there's no reason to crowdfund a his tank. There's no, there's no reason to crowd. Look, crowdfunding anything star wars is such a disingenuous proposition like, like a ghost yeah like the ghost like even the razor crest which even though the razor crest the mistake they made was that they blew it up while the blew it up yeah was going on yeah um i'm waiting for the ghost to explode um the 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 fact is is that there is no proposition you can make me where a crowdfund for star wars and i do mean like don't you find it interesting that it was the black series crowdfund that failed because I've always said that for star Wars home is where three and three quarter inches. And I know you're about to have a discussion about that uh, tomorrow. With Tony. Right? Yeah. Yep. Um, star Wars whole legacy, no matter how many joints are in those figures, whether they're super articulated or five POA, it's one star Wars is home is where you can get vehicles and play sets. Yeah. World building. And, yeah. World building. And and those vehicles are why they're so ravenous for it. The fact that that Hasbro has all but abandoned 
vintage collection except for its successful has labs and a few gimmies on the retail aisle like that bunker and stuff like that yeah shows that they they have lost the plot where star wars is concerned and i also believe that's why they screwed up and botched the whole indiana jones line they should have brought back out the super articulated three and three quarter inch stuff from the lost wave sdcc exclusive that people couldn't get as yes. well as the 2008 stuff rather than do those six inch figures which are pointless artifacts they're they're i don't even mean the build artifacts i mean the figures themselves yes are pointless artifacts so like crowdfunding for star wars crowdfunding for gi joe crowdfunding for only like that one transformer that they they did it was like a saber something oh yeah 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 um, that thing th yeah. that was a fair play for a crowdfund i i i'd never heard of it but like you going to tell me that mainstream Transformers collectors aren't going to want Unicron? Like, yeah. you really think that needed to be crowdfunded? Like, I, I've, I, I can't get behind. I can't get behind crowdfunding for any company that has a coffer of eleven billion dollars and then turns around and fires a bunch of people. <laughs> yes, yeah. right. And 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 like, okay. Haslab had two has only had two items so far that I thought were valid crowd funds and only and and one of them was thin rigs one of them was kind of thin the first one is the one we just mentioned the 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 weird sort of like offbeat japanese transformer thing yeah. that I'd, I'd never heard of um mm -hmm. and and then um not that that says a lot cuz I'm not really a transformers guy but victory um, saber victory saber yeah and I'm so glad that the the community of Transformers people had that opportunity to get that. Like, a, yeah. that's the, le the legit one. Um, the other one that I thought was close to being legit was the Proton Pack. And that's only because you never would see it coming that a toy company would do a prop replica of any kind like that. Yeah. Now, I still think they botched it. And I still think it was it was an unfair proposition they they didn't include a wand and wand. Said, that's what i was gonna say it was getting shady when they were like wand yeah. not included and i'm like what what it's like um so you got to unlock the wand hose you yeah. better hope it unlocks because and then you got to go see if you can find yourself a wand that's not at scalper prices yeah that's so they they still effed with it they still messed up the proposition oh yeah but conceptually i was like i can i can get there with that being Let's see how many people actually want a one-to-one -one proton pack that's standardized, yeah. whatever. But yeah, most of this stuff, man, is layups. Like e even even uh, all that dumb stuff that Mattel Creations does where they're like, we're doing a wrestling ring. And it's like, we did the Jurassic Park gates. That bombed. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> and for good reason. I, yeah. I even thought that Eternia, as, as much as... I was grateful that it was a crowdfund because I, even as a child, I didn't think Eternia looked like, I thought it was dumb. I, I, I was like, that doesn't look like Eternia in the show. Yeah. I, I'm not interested. Like yeah, I remember like fright zone, you know, you're like, yes, uh, yeah. the fright zone. It just looks like a, a, a playground that went to crap. Like it just, you know, it, puppet wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Eternia. I'll never forget being at Toys R Us and standing in front of the masters of the universe section and the boxes for Eternia were, were sitting there on the lower shelf. And I remember being as tall as that box. And I remember looking at it and going, yeah. this holds no appeal for me. Like th there's nothing here. And I just kind of breezed right by it and, and you know, whatever. Um, the only thing that, that would make me say potential crowdfund is because of its alleged size. But they make that mythology up for a lot of they're talking about that now with the giant man where they're like oh it's too big for retail i'm like don't give me that crap all right we've already had that massive bat wing in stores they yeah. you know target did the galaxy's edge relaunch of the legacy falcon that was a huge yeah. box like you can get you know like like ninja pointed out you can get ant man or giant man to you know you assemble in one way like those brachiosaurs and even that giant t-rex that i featured in one of my jurassic park videos mm -hmm. it didn't come in a box this long they had the tail off and in the bottom of the box so it came in a box like like this like it was it's very reasonable but they yeah. love to sit there and go oh shelf space and, and all this kind of stuff and oh they won't do it it's like they always make room you know yeah. if it yeah. sells they will find the room like yeah
Blue well, Serendipity is asking, are you wanting to sell the Spice Girls? I don't, I don't know if he's trying to hook up with you or. Uh, I, I mean, um, I hadn't really thought about it because they're not really in the way. How long would it take me to get those out? <laughs> uh, there, but uh, I hadn't really thought about it. Um, I don't. I don't know. Why are you a Spice Girls collector? And again, I'm not saying that sarcastically, as I've already yeah, established. Yeah. I did a whole video about it. So, um, yeah. You can hit up uh, Michael on Facebook, and uh, I don't know if you want to buy them. Hit him up. So I was just kind of holding on to that. Oh sure. Yeah, I don't. What what do you think about scales? Like, so you had already said that you think that Star Wars, um, you know, should be rooted more in the one eighteen scale, and and I agree that any kind of a world building line. Yeah, I'm not saying that it should only be one eighteen scale. My my kind of long term argument has been, you can go to other scales. You can, if you want to revisit, you know, the twelve inch Joe's mm -hmm. twelve inch Action Man. That's great. Yeah, if, if you want to do you know, six inch lines, that's great. But, you know, they're, they are squarely rooted in world building just because the Millennium Falcon's a character, or a Mobat's a character, or a His Tank's a character. And yeah, in six inch, okay, we're starting to see that these vehicles are coming out. They crowdfunded the His Tank. They got a vamp coming. But are, are you really going to have worlds or is it just about like dollies at that point? That's the thing is it's just about having these, these, humanoids that are just standing around with maybe a, a you know raise sideways fudge sickle speeder here and there like yeah. you know it, it's not kenner once again we go back to the well the last example we used was kenner's kenner talked themselves almost out of accessories which that's their corporate you know what but they also had a moment of wisdom where they said we're making 12 inch dolls right now for six million dollar man and other things in 1976 77 is that what uh Star Wars is going to be. And they were like, well, we can do a, a small range of them, they said, but we can't have a Millennium Falcon or an X-Wing or a TIE Fighter or anything like that. And that's not good. This this property from everything we've seen is all about the hardware. That's what they said, the hardware. They said it's all about the the fighters, the 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 creatures, the yeah. all that stuff. We've got to make something that's going to work with that and be affordable. And the three and three quarter inch scale was the magic scale that yep. Fisher Price Adventure people had already proved that. So yep. as much as adults sit there and they're like, well, well I'm just into getting the characters. Um, I don't I, I don't think that I don't think that the Black Series, the Black Series is for where you just don't have an interest in world building that particular property. So, so like for me, I went back and got all the revised, as much as it was a weight, I got all the revised head sculpts for the Rogue One heroes in Black Series because I wanted to have those heroes on display. I like those characters misused as they were in the reshoots, whatever, but whatever. I wanted that group of core heroes, but I wasn't interested beyond that in world building Rogue One, not that I had the opportunity or option anyway. Um, yeah. But with something like classic Star Wars, classic G.I. Joe, the world build is what made it famous. Yep. So in Real American Hero, the G.I. Joe headquarters, the Cobra Terror Drum, the USS Flag, all of those iconic things yeah. made G.I. Joe successful. And so right, there's because the figures were like the loss leaders. Like they, they've all historically said that figures are loss leaders. It's all about the vehicles and the play sets and the things like that that you put your figures into to have your adventures. Right, exactly. And I think that when when it comes down to serious collectors, and I'm not trying to disparage people who right now are collecting only six inch, I mean this in the future, like when when it all shakes out and we see who the real torch bearers still are. Yes. Right? Yeah. That the world building is going to be such that people are going to say, my my little corner of Star Wars is not complete unless I have an X-Wing or a TIE fighter, or by this point, it will be, unless I have Obi-Wan's Jedi star fighter or, you know, some, or, you know, the, um, the ghost or something like that, like that, that, that's, you know, I want the crew of the ghost and I want the ghost and I want them to be able to go in the ghost. I understand yeah. that. Like I get that whole idea. When that legacy Falcon came out, I was, I was blown away because as a, as a kid, I think the Millennium Falcon from Kenner is a perfect toy. I think it's great. 
The Legacy Falcon, though, is like a level up for an adult collector who says, sure. finally, the cockpit has four seats. Yep. Finally, you've got the corridors. You've got the, the medical bed. You've got yeah. you've got the storage areas. You've got this. You've got that. Awesome. Like, scale down a little bit. They all have to duck in under all those doorways. Yeah. I'm not going to yeah. get into that. But the point is that it's all there. So I, I don't know what it would be like for me to go into my Twilight years not having that legacy Falcon and that let it legacy add at on either side of my TV, you know, in the, in the screening room, uh, screening area over here, like that, yeah. that br brings me such pride. And, and I've got those two vintage collection, um, snow speeders right there next to that at with wedge and, and DAC in one and uh, no, I'm sorry, not DAC wedge and ha uh, Jansen in one yes. and Luke and Luke and DAC in the other. And that's really cool. It, Good shot, Jansen. Yeah, I said it. I said it in my Rogue One video. Hasbro used to really have, pardon the expression, but they used to have balls. Hasbro used to be like, let's take some risks, let's yep. do some cool stuff, and that's that whole super articulated three and three quarter inch line. No matter what they named it year after year, whether it was yeah. like vintage collection, and then it was legacy, and then it was saga, and then it was this whatever, whatever it was under, it was all part of the same idea, which yep. was high, highly detailed. Uh, more scaled up vehicles with really, really detailed figurines, accessory gaffs being what they were, which are excellently um, chronicled on Chronically Online's channel, by the way. He did this great thing showing all the, the lightsaber hilt gaffs yes. for Luke Skywalker across. That's a great video. Oh, great video. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's the world build. And so... Drew really says, good. and then they fired Bobby and went to crap. <laughs> but but that, yeah, it, I yeah. completely I know we're talking. In, yeah. in those mid aughts, mm -hmm. like Hasbro was bulletproof then. They were like, yeah. every background character in every Star Wars movie got a figure. Joe was rocking, Transformers mm -hmm. was on top. Like in, in, in the mid to late aughts, they were mm -hmm. pretty bulletproof. And then like 2012, 2013, you start to see like that, yeah, we're going we're gonna to release the grip on that whole first place a little bit. Right. I'm about to I'm about to fix my camera's focus. Don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, is that your camera's focus? I thought I had another storm come in. <laughs> no, that was that's my stupid camera. It does this thing where it's like it goes out of focus and then I have to literally and I didn't notice it until just now. I've probably been out of focus for like two hours. So I got about that. Uh there's another message from Blue Serendipity about um the Spice Girls thing. I I start it and we'll we'll come back. Oh, okay. I'll come back to it later. Sure. But uh, Jeremy, uh, thank you for the two dollars super chat. I I saw it. I saved it. And says, do you see some Haslabs being released at retail? Well, Ninja brought up a really good point in his video where he talked about how it's such a miscarriage of justice that there these molds are being held hostage by these these crowdfunding con yep. uh, not contracts but sort of like packs with. In other words, they're hyping up so much FOMO for these products that it's not that not that corporations actually care about their promises, but but in this case, they're hyping up so much FOMO to get people to buy into these. They're acting like this is the only chance you'll have. So, like, say that that Black Series Rancor failed, and now they're like, well, now it's never going to be made, guys. So yeah. whatever, <laughs> it's like really. So you guys are never going to see your way to providing that in any form or fashion, even though it has all these repaint and redeco options and all that kind of stuff. Cause there's been multiple rancors over the franchise. Yeah. Um, expanded universe. Force unleashed. Yeah. 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 All the kind of stuff Force Force yeah. yeah. And it's like, so you're just going to, you're just going to take that, that giant man and do it one time and then lock it up. Really? I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't, if you are going to do that Hasbro, that's really bad business. Like that's really bad business. Um, talk about leaving money on the table. Like just, They're, they are famous for that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, so I'm going to throw my two cents in on Jeremy's question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the Hasbro Joe team said that they were already looking at taking some of the lights and this that and whatever out of the his tank and selling mm -hmm. it for a lower price point at retail so they're they're already discussing it. right which i mean why they didn't just do that the first time because the his tank the his tank was like the vamp it was priced to be an easily accessible but not a not a small budget vehicle like say the claw or anything like that it was supposed yeah. to be yeah. And, and but as was, far as vehicle goes, it's a smaller vehicle. Yes. It's not the size of a mauler. It's, no. it's comparable to a vamp or an awe striker. 
And really, yeah. when you look at a vamp, it's four pieces. Right. And that's not even including the, the freaking barbell rollers on the bottom. It's, right. it's a four-piece vehicle. It's a small tank. And I said that on another stream, and people started coming at me. And really? it's not a small vehicle. And I'm like, the Hiss is a small vehicle. Yeah. The Hiss 2 is bigger. Yes. Like, I could name a million vehicles that are bigger than a Hiss tank. Yeah. The Hiss yeah, they, they came at me because I said, you you do not need to crowdfund a small yeah, it's, it's not small chatter decent. All you have to do is literally hold the hiss up next to the vamp from 1982, 83, yep. and you have your answer. Like yeah. they're, they're the same size, like yeah. they're, they're the same price point. Like yep. I, they hold the same amount of figures. Like that they, yeah. they were designed to be the the Cobra and Joe vehicle in that price point. Like yeah, they were the equivalency. And then, and then you get people saying like, oh, well, you know, they added a, a troop ramp in the back. And I'm like, yeah, because the Hiss 2 didn't do that, right? I mean, don't act like that's something new. It's not like groundbreaking. Right. But I, you know, I will give them credit. They, they put some playability features into that vehicle, and they have been sorely lacking on anything toyetic for a long time. Oh, really? Yeah. But, yeah, they, I don't know, whatever. They, they put some stuff in there. See, and then that. Robert's Infinite Realm says, I can't do vehicles in 112 scale. The space is the big thing. And that's, you know, that's another argument where I would, I would talk to people and, you know, you're going back a couple of years, mm -hmm. right? So arguments change over time. And I would be talking to people and they're like, oh yeah, well, you know, yeah, classified and Marvel Legends. And I'm like, but you, how are you going to get vehicles? Oh, it's not a scale for vehicles. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay. So it's, it's just, just dollies. Yeah. It's just, and I'm like, okay, so it's, it's non-world building. It's just, here's my Jedi Knight Luke Skywalker scaled up. Okay, fine. Right. And then the vehicles start coming, and then they're like, oh, man, vehicles. And I'm like, whoa, that's a whoa. Do you remember mm -hmm. six months ago what you were saying about 112 scale, and now you're changing that tune? It's because it's because G.I. Joe and Star Wars, they, they had to figure it out the hard way. It can't survive without vehicles. There's that's And that's not, that's nope. not a shortcoming of the, those IPs. Yeah. Those IPs were based around the hardware. Yeah, so and it's here's like, something I starred right there. It says, is Han Solo Han Solo without the Millennium Falcon? Right. It's not a complete set without the Falcon, Han, and Chewie together as a trio. It's just nope. not. The uh, Thunder like, Machine's not the Thunder Machine without, you know, a driver. No, it's on not. And on and on. It, 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 like, that's what I said about the Indiana Jones Adventure Series. As much as people say, oh, well, Indiana Jones doesn't have a signature vehicle. I'm like, no. But every movie, he has scenes where he's in chases in vehicles because that's part of the world build of his 1930s, you know, environment. Swashbuckling so, cereals, yeah. Yes, exactly, right? If you have Robin Hood, you really should have a few horses in that figure line, you know? Like, Great. that was yeah. the big shortcoming with the Prince of Thieves line. I, I'm fully convinced one of the shortcomings was no horses. It was a big mess. So you got to have vehicles. You got to have, you got to have that kind of stuff. And isn't it interesting that the Black Series was only out for a few months before people started asking Hasbro, ever going to do vehicles in this size? Ever going to do vehicles in this scale? Yeah. And suddenly the pressure mounted. And the next thing you know, and, but but you can't collect them all. Yeah. Give me give me one sec, Michael. Sure. Matt, I, I wasn't talking about you, dude. And that that's why I don't name names. But I wasn't talking about you, brother. So anyway, he, he was in that chat. Oh. Um, and then just Jeff says, what the frick is a thunder machine man i hope you're joking because i it's it, thunder machine it's over there <laughs> come on man the thunder machine dreadnought to, forget it mm -hmm. anyway i've had Sorry. it since childhood i've got i've got my thunder machine yep. what do you think about the the sound wave one i want your opinion on this that's the one where sound wave is the thunder machine it's like the combo thing yeah. kind of like yeah. the his tank is megatron or whatever mm -hmm. uh, I think I think it's an interesting novelty. I'm 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 glad that they're dabbling in that kind of stuff because it, it's the closest thing to innovation that Hasbro's going to get right now. Keep talking. I my my only thing with it is that I know that people were disappointed by the quality of the um, his tank Megatron transformation, and and that's the whole thing is that the Transformers community has very understandably high standards. And so yeah, it, it might it might disappoint both. Like the, the his tank people are going to be like, well, as a his tank, the panels don't come together right on the sides and it doesn't, it, the, the, the crunch puzzle doesn't quite lock up. And the Transformers people are going to be like, well, his robot mode is not as 
carefully thought out as his alt mode was. And they all have legitimate grievances on that. So the only concern is, will it, in trying to be both things, will it satisfy no one? That's, you know. Fair. So uh, now Jeff's yelling. I don't know oh. shit about G.I. Joe. Okay. <laughs> fair. That is that is fair, my friend. So I went and got it while while Michael was talking about the Megatron his tank. This is the Thunder Machine, mm -hmm. right? So it's a dreadnought vehicle, mm -hmm. doors open, et cetera, et cetera. So here's here's the Thunder Machine, Jeff, mm -hmm. and the driver for the Thunder Machine is this guy, Thrasher. Thrasher. And Thrasher is based his head sculpt is based on one of the designers, uh, mm -hmm. the GI Joe team designers from Hasbro. So that that's kind of my argument, like. To have the Thunder Machine without Thrasher, right, it's kind of weird. And to have right. Thrasher without the Thunder Machine is kind of weird. Mm -hmm. It's basically like talking about Han Solo and the Millennium Falcon. So, yep. Yep. yes, Jeff. So that's going to be another, because he's asking, oh, isn't that a Transformers 2? Yeah, it's going to be the Soundwave mm -hmm. uh, Thunder Machine. One thing I will say, Michael, is that I'm I'm a huge collector of his tanks. I have 50 of them. Most of them are customs, right, that I've made. Huh? Yep. But when I got the Megatron his tank, mm -hmm. I put it into his tank mode and it is the exact same size mm -hmm. as the original version one his tank. Oh, that's great. That's it, great. it just has a, a different looking gun on the top. It looks yeah. perfect. Well, then the see, I've only been reading about the, the results anecdotally from different people because I don't I don't actually have those, but yeah, but I've I've been sent pictures and stuff, and and I know that you know quality control being what it is these days some people probably got bum you know bum transformers yeah it, there yeah. are panels that do have to lock so you'll have mm -hmm. a tab on this panel and a tab on that one almost like the rolling thunder where they have to yep. like, the panels tab up yep but but mine it it closed up perfectly it takes a little doing like you you have to muscle it a little mm -hmm. but it it looks great and you can just walk right by it if you don't look at the cannon or the gray on the underside from his legs you don't really realize it's megatron Oh, well, that's that's and, encouraging. And yeah. hey, Jeff, uh, it's totally cool, brother. You can ask away, man. I'm, I'm just I'm sorry. I forgot about that. It's all good. But yeah, that's just kind of mm -hmm. where I'm living. I, I thought the Megatron was is pretty OK. And I will say his head sculpt is very Sunbow accurate. Uh huh. Wait, is that was that Marvel animation? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's what I thought. But mm -hmm. it's very G1 cartoon. Yeah. Accurate. Yeah, so I, I will give them credit for that. So. Well, that's 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 great to know. Like, yeah. I, you know, because I because I've only I only get my I only get my G.I. Joe Transformers crossover uh, testimonials from other people. Like, I, yeah. you know, I have to take what they say, you know, at face value. So that's good to hear. I, I like the Bumblebee, too. He actually does have metal parts. Uh huh. He's the one that turns into the uh, Ostriker. Ostriker. Yeah. yeah. So the, oh. the weird thing is the Bumblebee has metal. The Megatron has no metal. Oh, this is a little weird. Megatron's all plastic. There's nothing like chromed out on him. He's uh -huh. just he's just different shades of gray and black. Right. The little, little pops are red, but the yeah, Bumblebee's pretty cool. He's he's chilling up here on this shelf, but he's he's not too bad. I'm I'm waiting for the. Have, I would have thought they would have done Hound into the Vamp, right? At some point, <laughs> right? Yeah, or because Braun. they did the San Diego Comic Con Hound Vamp that came in the same set with the Jetfire Sky Striker. Yep. Yep. Yep, that's right. And, it, and he came with a little mini blaster. That's right. It, that must be why I'm thinking of it. Yeah. 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 Because it's yeah. right. It's actually right here. I got it. Right. So what's the point of having right vamp without clutch? But it's right here. Oh right. yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the hound vamp. It's just got some transformers markings on it along with uh -huh. the Joe stuff. Yeah. And then it came with the little blaster backpack. Yep. Yeah, I have a, I have that cool. vamp, but it's the basic 25th anniversary yeah. target, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's the exact same vehicle. It's just mm -hmm. the seats are different colors. And yeah. Nothing I like else. The, I like the shade of green on that better than mine. Yeah. It's it's yeah. a good, it's a good, good vehicle. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the last thing I, I really want to talk about, and I can't thank you enough for hanging out with me, Michael. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I always love when we talk, and you and I. You know, you're in you're in Georgia. I'm in New Mexico. We only really see each other when I come out for Joe Fest. But I I can't thank you enough. And everybody in the chat, right? There's still a lot of people in the chat. So thank you all for hanging out with us. I I know you're a really you're a really intelligent, educated guy. Oh, thanks. And, and I use the word intelligent, not smart. 
even though you are smart, right? But there's a difference between smarts and intelligence. Sometimes I don't know how to tie my shoes in the morning, but (laughs) SMRT. I, we all understand. I, I know you understand, and maybe some people in the chat do too, understand how theories work, right? So a theory is like, Someone throws out a theory and then they they kind of quantify it or they back it up with like, well, I did this research or I mm-hmm. made these observations, you know, observational learning, and that led me to this theory. So right. I theorized this. Doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate, but it's a theory, right? Black holes were a theory based on mathematical constructs until they could actually see a black hole. Right. My theory, and um, this this kind of it's rooted in my education that I don't really talk about very much. People just know like I'm an army guy. But if you look back historically at mental illness, medical procedures, and things like that, in the 50s and 60s, the big breakthrough in mental health science was the lobotomy, right? Right. So here we are, you know, in in the future time, fighting crime. I mean, you made a, a lethal weapon reference earlier, so I had to make a cops reference. Absolutely. Yeah. As soon as you said it's thin rigs, but you kept going, <laughs> I, I didn't want to be like, nice, nice reference. <laughs> so my theory kind of goes along with that, where, you know, in the moment, people kind of get, they get sucked up in this, like, man, that's a great idea. Like, I, I, right. I love it. It's fantastic. And you're like, yeah, because we take away their mental illness. It's like, no, you're making them freaking zombies. What are you doing? Like what when you put this thing in there and you go like that. I have this theory, and some people agree with it, and some people get upset about it. But my theory is that, and and sometimes I, I take pause when I bring up the theory because I, I don't want people either like unsubbing or like setting me on fire. No, you're you're doing the dramatic pause, you're getting people primed yeah. for what yeah, you're like doing. I'm drawing them in, right? Yeah. Um most classified collectors are not gi joe fans that's been my theory i want to say from the word go Mm -hmm. and i you know i can and when i say argue i don't mean like like have a disrespectful back and forth conversation arguing is just you know we just say our points and they go back and forth like arguing doesn't need to be negative but right when i argue that theory um I, I have a lot of evidence to back that up, but that's always been my theory that most most classified collectors are not Joe people. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if that some people are like, well, what, what's a Joe person? I'm like, well, you don't have to get defensive. <laughs> you know, just like calm down. <laughs> I'm not offending your battle cat over there, but right. But yeah, that's just kind of it's always been my thing. And 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 I noticed it with um the dragonfly has lab, which again, I didn't think needed to be a has lab, but people were like, just it's just three feet long, Chad. And I'm like, I don't care. You know what I mean? I, don't, I got a seven and a half foot. Yeah. And I know you have one too. Yeah. Right. I mean, I got a seven and a half foot piece of plastic right there. Mm-hmm. Like your dragonfly does not impress me. No, not at all. When they not announced Glenda as uh-huh. one of the stretch goals and you and I have the same opinion on Facebook toy groups, right? The same opinion. I'm I'm in such a finite number of them that uh, they, they are just woo. E- either they're echo chambers or it's everybody coming at you with the pitchforks. Yes, yes. But uh, immediately. I, sorry, oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. No. I was just gonna say that the slime of humanity. They, oh. I, I, I had to, I'll say it. I'll say it. The slime of humanity. <laughs> they've produced the worst trolls and the worst people with the worst instincts. I've got 11 years of receipts to back it up. Oh, They're God, horrible. I know. And you post them, too. Like, oh, sure. You're, you're just like, oh, on my personal Facebook account, look at that. <laughs> it's just well, like, because people there? don't believe you. They're like, that's not possible. A human being wouldn't do that. I'm like, yeah, they would. Oh, and a I lot of the G.I. Joe classified people. Stupid-ass conversations, too. The G.I. Joe and the G.I. Joe classifieds people can be some of the worst because they come out of their groups and they have, they have sent me private messages out of nowhere, like cold calls where they're just like, one guy was like, I "Oh know- yeah, I know you secretly collect them." Yeah, you guy- secretly collect them. That was like two years ago, and I'm like, yeah. "No, I don't." It actually took them announcing, kind of like with Dazzler when I when they finally announced Dazzler. That's when the the right version of Dazzler. Yeah. That's when I went in on my X Men group. Mm-hmm. When they finally, because they had announced and brought out Lady J, they brought out bad versions of Scarlet, they brought out Baroness, they 
they were announcing stuff. I was like, nope. I was like, if I ever collect six inch GI Joe, it's only going to be the ladies and I'm not going to do it until they have cover girl. And as soon as, cause I like Scarlet Lady J and cover girl. Like I don't discriminate, but cover girl's the one that sometimes gets left out. And I'm yes. like, they don't do cover girl. And she shouldn't. She no. shouldn't. No. So when they announced cover girl, I went, I got the ladies and I'm done. But people will be, then be like, see, he does collect. It's like, that's not a collection. That's a focus five figures and I'm out. Like that's, I was, you know. I was joking with somebody about that today. And they were like, yeah, I know that Chad secretly collects classified. And it was a total joke, like between mm -hmm. friends, just like little right. banter. And I was like, well, uh, I have openly said I have seven. So I guess you could say it's pretty serious. <laughs> you know, like I, I have seven of them. And three of those are, are just for my wife. You know? Right. Because she likes Cobra Commander, so I made her a custom hooded one. Uh huh. And uh, she likes the Baroness. But right. I had always said Low Light, who's my number one Joe, mm -hmm. him and Serpentor, Serpentor, uh -huh. are going to be my litmus tests for yep. classified. And I saw them both, and I was like, nothing. I yep. feel nothing. Yep. But I, when I saw Dusty, and it looked like he had a soggy pancake on his head, <laughs> I was like, no, not interested. I don't. Yeah. I don't I, I saw love, him and I was like, it, 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 it literally looks like a Marvel Legends like cosplaying as Dusty. Like I'm in the finest, right? The GI mm -hmm. Joe Costume Club, like you know that everybody yep. knows that. And I've seen people who do great costumes, but when you see them translated to real life, you're like, that's it's a really good effort, but right? It just doesn't look the same as animation or comic books. There's something weird about that Storm mm -hmm. Shadow. Yeah. So when I saw that Dusty, I was like. That would be like if you like dressed up a Marvel Legends to look like Dusty. Yeah, like he, he's kind of Dusty, but he's not. He's not. Yeah, and that's the whole thing. Like, and that that's your latitude where it's like, okay, consider Serpenter. that <laughs> if I really like if I if I like Dusty a lot, and I do from childhood, but Dusty's not enough to bring me in by default. In other words, I can still look at that Dusty and go, nah, right? That should give everybody an indication of. Like, okay, even though CoverGirl ended up looking like Joan Rivers, I still went and got CoverGirl because the the G.I. Joe, the women of G.I. Joe are that cool to me. Like I wanted that that group of 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 women from G.I. Joe, yeah. good, good and bad, right? Yeah. So so I was real willing to cross that line for those, but like I saw the rock and roll. I love the original 13, but I saw their rock and roll and I'm like, why is he wearing a two-tone shirt that's like yeah it's it's like a version one version two mashup yeah yeah, yeah with like, all the is, tattoos yeah i was like what is going on here like this yeah. is just bizarre and i was able to pass on that you know the next hurdle will be um uh flash it's like if they ever do flash maybe but by that point yeah. many of the others will be gone in the original 13 clutch and or no not clutch who came with the ram cycle breaker Breaker and um, rock and roll and some of these others will have already come and gone. And, and then they made Grunt an army builder. Yeah. And I'm like, Grunt has a rich history and it has his name Graves on his body armor, which right. none of the other figures have, but you gave him a steel core because you can't call it steel brigade. You right. gave him a steel core helmet to make him an army builder with Graves on his body armor. You know nothing about the rich history of, of Grunt that went over like, what, 20 years of the comics? Yep. Nothing. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's an army builder. And I'm like, eh, Grunt is not an army builder. Like, I have so much Joe merch that Grunt is the face of G.I. Joe. That's the whole thing. Like, he is the face of Real American Hero because yeah. of that because of that image. Yeah. But I got in trouble a few years ago because even though I collected the Hama comics as a child, even though I love Real American Hero and all that kind of stuff, uh -huh. I also said, as a, just a fun video, I did this video called Build Your Armies, which was all about, like, ways in the 80s that we could troop build different characters if yes. we wanted to yep and i made the point i was like you can do an interesting smattering of grunts zaps and desert grunts to create a kind of green shirt group you know back there and everybody was jumping they're like they're all individuals and i went i know that it's just a video yeah. calm your you know is uh, but they once you've gotten the sculpting to the level that we've got it at now, where people aren't sharing heads so much, yeah. that argument does go out the window where it's like, well, now Grunt is an individual. Now he is a standalone character, thanks to uh, both the 25th anniversary line ish and especially classified. And so it's like, yeah, I can totally buy into that. 
Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but I guess what I was saying is I do have reverence for the character, but it yep. was funny what, what I received on that army and, video. And I'm somewhat of a hypocrite and which I don't like to be, but sometimes it just happens to the best of us. And I'm probably not the best of us anyway, but when they came out with the, the last two waves of those Walmart retro, even though they weren't O-ring and they shouldn't have called them retro, you know, the, the yep. hyper articulated yep. moderns, the stalker, Mm -hmm. the grunt the cobra officer and the cobra trooper fantastic fantastic yep. sculpts everything about them i bought up as many of them as i could and i take those grunts i pop the head off i put on marauder gunrunners heads and i just make green shirt armies to fill all my vehicles i mean you know when you i'm not even gonna say it but i got a lot of vehicles that need seats filled i, I didn't want to be that guy and be like well actually i have two generals thank you and they need a lot of seats filled mm -hmm. you know because that sounds like a little bit like showboating didn't they but, just announce uh, for classified? Didn't they just announce shooter? Oh yeah, and they made her night force, and she's because out, you know it has to be the night force exclusive, right? Oh, so it's an exclusive to what Pulse Walmart? Oh, Wal. Okay, great. Yeah, she's yeah. a Walmart night force exclusive. Ah, all right. Well, because she's in all black anyway, and I guess right. it was just the yeah. I know, mean that makes sense, but it's yeah. like that. That still means Walmart distribution okay great so you can find it at ollie's I, <laughs> I, I don't know just wait a month and they'll find them at ollie's for five bucks <laughs> you can have an army of shooters but yeah. oh that's great anyway um what do you what do you got coming up so i know you're working on your indie video yeah i've been working on that for like six weeks and uh, people probably think the channel's dead but it's not because i've been putting out other videos in in the meantime um and uh uh, so I've, I just put out this video about completing my uh, Pride of the X-Men villains group, my X-Men arcade bosses. Oh, group. is that the one where you got uh, somebody came at you over Juggernaut? Yeah, <laughs> three people have done it. I, I swear, I swear I'm going to I'm going to try and pitch to Dragon Con in a few years doing like geek open mic stand up comedy night where it's like humor that only geeks would get. Yeah. And one of my opening bits is going to be. Why is there always some jerkwad in, in a discussion about X Men that always has to throw in there? You know, Juggernaut's not really a mutant. It's His like powers are magic. Brr. It's like yeah, thanks, thanks, nothing burger. Really appreciate that. Not pertinent to the discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I put that video out today. Um, I'm doing a restoration for the latter half of the week. I'm filming it tomorrow. Um, I'll be announcing that tomorrow night uh, on Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Um, and uh, in the background, I'm still working like a doozer on uh, Indy 5, trying to get Ooh, that. Fraggle into. Rock reference. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, thank you, Jeremy, for the kind words. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I threw it up for you. No, I was, sorry. I, 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 I'm I know. always looking. Um, I but I, uh, I've got some other videos that are on the way. I'm still working on that big freeze chamber, uh, the custom freeze chamber playset video. How's that I'm still coming? Well, I'm sanding and I'm filling and I'm prepping and I'm trying to get it all dolled up for the for the cameras. And I got delayed by this Indy Five review. Is the um, build done? The build, the build itself is done. It's now me just fine tuning it and getting it looking nice for the cameras. Because so, it's what's yeah. up? No, please. No, I was just saying. It, you know, when you go into 3D printed custom prototyping, it's it's um, and I got this from Joe Dickerson. He was had the skills to prototype it yeah your your mindset going into prep for it has to be half half playset half model kit before it's done once it's done it's full-on playset but you've got to approach it like okay to get this thing ready for prime time you know i've got to do a little bit of uh, of work so yeah that's for you from chronically oh thank you sir that's very kind yeah and then drew says uh I'd say, but he's still part of the brotherhood, you dumbass. <laughs> and that's yeah, exactly. pretty much what you said, right? You were like, well, talk to the people for decades of comics and blah, blah, blah. Right. Why are you bringing this grievance to my doorstep? I have no agency with Marvel. And then yeah. Daredevil Dave's got to go. Thanks for being here, buddy. Appreciate sure. it. The other comment I keep getting is, actually, it's the brotherhood of evil mutants. And I'm like, yeah, not in this cartoon, though. Yeah. So if you watch the video, you'd learn something. Yeah. Right. And even Matt says Juggernaut's latent mutant powers were just enhanced. Right. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to say, mm -hmm. you did that video on the freeze chamber. Mm -hmm. Right. And so 
you, you also talk about like, well, if I had the skills to customize stuff and I don't, and it, you know, if you paint wood, it looks like wood. And then I, I looked over at my flag and I'm like, yeah, that looks like wood. <laughs> well, my, my, my plinth also looks like wood. That's one of those ones you can't get around. It's like, yeah. unless yeah. you're going to pay tens of thousands of dollars for a custom fabricated yeah. something or another. So yeah. I have to thank you for two things. One uh, in your flag video where you built your custom lower deck, Mm -hmm. You you were the first one that I remember out of everyone who was doing those custom flag videos after um, Joe Berg. Yep. Where you said Flint Gray. Yep. And then you were like, oh, yeah, Flint, get it? Flint Gray. And I was like, that's the color. So I went and got the color. And, and yes, you do still see the wood grain. So I have to thank you for the paint color because I didn't have to go match it. You did it for me. And then when you did your, your freeze chamber mm -hmm. video, the first one, and I was like, you know what? Because I, I make a bunch of custom 118 scale uh, mask vehicles. I know yeah. you, you've you seen my Rhino and stuff. Yep. And I was like, I'm going to collaborate with somebody. Because I can do the mountain, right? Mm -hmm. I can shape the mountain and hard yep. code it and all that stuff. Yep. I'm going to collaborate with somebody to make me the Boulder Hill gas station. Oh, that's and cool. True. And, and so when we were at Gel Fest, that guy who had all those huge dioramas, that dude uh -huh. Steve, yep. he and I started talking. And I was like, hey, man, do you do commissions? He's like, yeah. I was like, I got one for you, and so he's helping me. He's oh, helping that's me build awesome! A true 118 scale Boulder Hill. I was trying to do it myself, but you know the base of Boulder Hill, right? You've got oh, a yeah. Boulder Hill. It's yeah. that one piece, and everything slots in. Mm -hmm. So when you scan it and you try to print it, my printer base wants to make you, you know almost tiles, right? To make that base that big, and once I print the tiles and start doing the walls, everything gets wonky at some point. Like that, it, it that, becomes not flush and I don't have those skills. Well, that, yeah. And that's why I told uh, Joe, I was like, Hey, look, I'm just trying to scale up the micro Bespin sets. Yeah. And he was, and, and I said, I've already been turned down by like three or four people because they're, they're saying that the, the base plate for the freeze chamber section would just be too big. Because the actual scale of the micro figures to the different sets is actually kind of janky. It's right. The sets are larger than the, you know, and he was like, no problem. He's like, let me work it out. And so he went and he just started to reconceptualize all of it while still maintaining the look of the play sets. He was like, he was like, look, I've decided that the control room doesn't just need to be a, a bridge with a, with an archway on the top. Like it needs to have like more modular capability. He's like, we're going to have a tunnel here. The freeze chamber doesn't need to have the base plate because most of your Kenner play sets in three and three quarter inch scale right. did not have a base plate. Like they just like the death star and the Ewok village. They just, the post is set on the floor. Yeah. Right. And I was like, Free genius. Yeah. so it's really cool what he's done, but it is a prototype. And so it's like, I'm having to kind of massage it a little bit. And that's, I expected that. that that's not a fault on him at all. He was prototyping this for me. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting when it all shakes out. And I'm, I'm hoping to get it done. God, I, I want it done before Thanksgiving if I can. I'd like that video out. So we'll see. So you got the whole shebang ready to go. Whole shebang ready to go. I'm just, you know, trimming a few pieces, making a few things, you know, getting those railings nice and straight, you know, like yeah. making sure they look good on camera. I got to spray paint the, I've connected the, the, um, the control room sort of like exterior arch way with the window. Yeah. And I've got that epoxy together and now I've sanded it. I've got a, I've sanded it and filled it. I got to spray paint it. So there's still a few steps involved, but it's going to look really nice when it gets done. And I'm, it's going to be something I'm really proud of. I don't know how I'm going to display it though, because <laughs> because it's modular and it and it goes in one direction. If you saw from the preview, yeah. so it's like this thing. If you used, he made it modular, so you don't have to use all the parts. Right. But if you use all the parts, it's longer than the flag. So it's like I could see that. Yeah. yeah, like it's just this pathway of dark adventure, you know, all the way to the end. And um, and I and again, I've got things that were in my request ask design that Joe did to the letter, and it was my mistake, not mistake functionally, but I'll be calling out things where I'm like, if I knew then what I know now, I would have yeah. said this part needs to be a little more whatever, you know. So it'll be an interesting video when it gets done. 
I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I know that's been like a passion project of yours for a while, and it and yeah. I I you know I appreciated the fact that it, it kind of sparked that in me. Like, yeah, I could do that with a Boulder Hill. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna do that with a Boulder Hill, and yeah. that's. That's that's the thing about you know having that creative side where you I don't have the the 3D printing skills. I know mm-hmm. a lot of people who do like Steve's toys, like, oh, I'm gonna make that unproduced 1995 three and three quarter inch G.I. Joe train. Here we go. And I'm like, dude, let me just buy one from you. Like, I'm not gonna try to print that myself. It'll come out like right. you know, looking like something out of a Disney cartoon, you know, some kind of right. Casey Jones circus train. But at the same time. I, I like to share customs with people because maybe it'll just spark that little thing in their mind where like, oh, well, they did that. Like, you know, Michael's working with somebody to do a Bestman freeze chamber. I'm going to do, you know, not the exact same thing, but I'm right. going to do a Boulder Hill mm-hmm. so on and so forth. So I, yeah. I really appreciated that video. And, and I thought it was cool at the end where you and DV sat down and played. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's all people... People love to like, they love to sit there and say that I'm just this guy that just hates on everything. And, and it's like, no, I'm just honest. I I don't understand when honesty became hate because I do all these videos where I'm like, yeah. here's, here's a dream project I had that I'm bringing to fruition. Yeah. Look at this. Oh, sure. My humor can be a little sarcastic. And I think a lot of people don't speak sarcasm anymore. So they just assume, oh, what a horrible, mean spirit. Yeah, bully yeah you're, you're negative Nelly. You're not being sarcastic. Yeah, I'm not. And so, like, I I really plug into what you're talking about when it comes to I've always wanted a G.I. Joe scale Boulder Hill. Like, I get that because as fun as Mask was, we wished it could integrate with our G.I. Joe and Star Wars lines. Like, that yep. would have been so cool. Um so when I, you know, when you said that about your Boulder Hill, I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to see the first sneak peek yeah. of when this, you know, starts to arrive. But yeah, like people love to just generalize. They, the YouTube algorithm at this point is so mercenary that it shows, yep. I'm saying this to everybody out there listening right now. It shows you a mirror of yourself. It shows you videos of what you're watching. So, so. And that means tonally, not channels anymore, but subject matter. And so people who sit there and tell me, they're like, all you ever do is, is bitch. And all you ever do is negative videos. And I'm like, wow, you know, my, my positive videos vastly outweigh and outnumber my critical negative videos by far. And I'm like, and I've started to tell people who complain at me, one guy did it yesterday. I'm like, one guy did it on this uh, chat before he got deleted. It's like, yeah, I, yeah, you 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 are being given what you put into YouTube at this point. Mm-hmm. YouTube's algorithm is giving you what your habits are. So if you're seeing, I said this to a guy yesterday, if you're seeing videos from me that are negative, quote unquote, or critical, but you're not seeing any of my positives, that's on you, pal. That's not on me. Yeah, that's that is you. Because I've got so many positive videos, you wouldn't know what to do. You you would literally get logic looped like a like a robot in a Star Trek episode. Yeah. Like you wouldn't know how to handle it. Yeah. Rollkeeper says, I'm from Jersey. I was weaned on sarcasm. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn, so mm-hmm. I feel you there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, that being said, so you've been around for 10 plus years. Like mm-hmm. you've got videos and videos and playlists for forever. Right. Forever. And... You know, I've only been around for not even two years. Yeah. Right. So like, like a drop in the bucket compared to so many other, like you and say like a what's on Joe mine, you know, they've been around for right. 10 years or HCC 788, you know, all, mm-hmm. all the guys who, who talk toys and GI right. Joe that are in like my sphere. But I always try to balance between doing something cool. Like, Hey, I got this. Freaking awesome mint condition Sergeant Savage P40 Warhawk, and I'm going to do a cool video about it. Yeah. Cool, right? Uh, yeah. But here's the thing. Here's the reality of it, and I know you you can attest to this. I can spend a week mm-hmm. doing, you know, not really the research. Like, I, I know the history of Sergeant Savage, but, like, maybe right. writing a script if I want it to be polished and then finding Sergeant Savage videos and cartoons and the commercial for this sucker, which was in the intro tonight, by the way. 
Right. And I put the Robo Skull in there too. But, you know, I could spend a week doing all that and then editing it. And I know you know where I'm going. But at the same time, I can take this, mm -hmm. my phone, and I can go yep. out in the car and I can yell for five minutes, mm -hmm. barely edit anything and get more views. Yeah. Oh, dude, the, the it, video it's such an imbalance. Oh, it totally is. And it shows what people's viewing habits are. And that's that's the whole point. It's like I can sit there and spend weeks doing a video about this crazy Tomb Raider magazine. And it is one of the, it is one of my favorite videos I've ever done as far as telling a story that no one's really explored. And it's really interesting and it's hilarious and creepy and all kinds of stuff. But nobody watches that. But I but I drop a video that took me 45 minutes from start to finish to make because I didn't do a script. And it's just me talking about Disney's stupid um, physical media decisions. Yeah. And yeah. suddenly I'm getting above average views like for the first few days and it's doing really well. But the, all the comments are coming in and, and, you know, there's a disproportionate number where it's like, here's this guy just complaining again. And it's like, well, dude, guess what? You showed up for this one, but mysteriously you didn't show up for the seven positive ones that I that I just did. That's yeah. on you, pal. That's not on me. Like, I, yeah, I made a short about that new black spider six inch classified that they just showed the reveal mm -hmm. of. Right. It was a short, right? So you're mm -hmm. talking 60 seconds or less. Mm -hmm. And I showed that figure and then I showed 1994 Beachhead version three. And I was like, it's literally version three Beachhead. Mm -hmm. because it's using beachhead's gear right i wasn't knocking on it i was just pointing it out mm -hmm. i thought in a way it was kind of a nod to 94 beachhead yeah. three. he even has yellow freaking pouches why does night force night force black spider have yellow pouches there's nothing yellow in night force black gray fluorescent orange od green sure all day long but nothing yellow ever and so i just pointed it out and immediately another toy youtube channel was like the thing's not even out. I haven't even talked about it. Why are you hating? And I, I wanted to be like, you didn't even watch my freaking toy room tour video. And people supposedly go Bleh, over right. toy room tour videos, but mine tanked. Yeah. Yeah. Because like it, as much as I love to be positive about toys and share like, hey, look at this thing because we're stewards of these pieces of history. And I love this and it's gorgeous. And I just want to share it with you because maybe mm -hmm. you might want to go get it. No, people want to see me screaming in my car. <laughs> right, right. And that alone is, I don't want to say 90%, because it's probably mm -hmm. more like 65, 70%. But there's a good deal of sarcasm. Oh, look who's here. Ah, Jeremy Jernigan. It's Wednesday, my dudes. Is it? Is it your Wednesday? Was what it he, what is he complete saying? Wednesday? What is he saying? I didn't think it was a loose butt complete Wednesday. I, I think maybe we walked on them. Oh, look, YouTube. No, is no, no, no. They were no, they were going to be on um, world class bullshitters tonight. Oh, okay. Well, see, that's a gray area. That's a gray area. Yeah. Um, there, something that Simple Tricks is saying. He's like, who is who is the fault? Who is to fault the chef or the consumer? If the dish isn't prepared and served, then the consumer won't consume. Yeah, but see, here's the thing. That's implying that the dish if the dish is served up then the consumer gets it and consumes it we're talking about the youtube algorithm here where the youtube algorithm doesn't doesn't any longer say that just because you subscribe to somebody you're going to actually get the notification or the video in your feed unless you've got certain buttons clicked beyond being a subscriber the point is is that the algorithm is futzing with things beyond that simple explanation so you can make something really really good and positive and whatever and spend weeks on it make it totally rewatchable and funny and all that kind of stuff i've done it over and over and over and over and over again yeah. and guess what within the last two, 18 months to two years all bets are off now if those actually get in front of all your subscribers and and or i think that's what johnny was saying I, mm -hmm. I think he was just making the analogy between like us producing the videos versus like the chef creating the food kind of a thing right but it's but it's like the the dish has been prepared and and it has been served, but the consumer's not even seeing it on the banquet table. Like, so they get this false impression that that you know all we ever serve is like marmite on toast. Like it's you know, yeah. So here's a here's a shout out for us. 
Uh, Lilith's here and says, this is a special shout out, which I can't do at the moment to Chad. Thanks for your videos, buddy. And to Michael retro blasting. Love you, honestly. Uh, and your quality work. Keep it up and have fun. Oh, very kind. Thank you so much, Lilith. That's very kind of you. All the way from Australia. Oh, so, so I have to say. It was it was a video, right? I, I don't want to call it long form because people think long form and they hear like 20 minutes, but really long form is like mm -hmm. almost anything that's right. kind of not a short these days. But you did that video about how like the algorithm and shorts and you're not putting shorts. Mm -hmm. That that freaking blew me away. When I saw that video, I was like, man, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I couldn't get around the logic of it when it when a, another channel was talking about it. I was like, oh, yeah, well, if viewer retention is a big factor in videos going up or down in the algorithm in the search results and it yeah. is then and and suddenly the feedback was coming in from that video from people who were like this is this is where it's an advantage that people have lost their decorum and their filter they're all walking around like they can just say whatever they want yeah this was really helpful because suddenly they were like yeah i was one of those guys that like clicked away every time you did like a video that was a short or i was a guy that clicked away every time you did a video that isn't a short and I'm like, uh-huh, this is what's happening. You're literally trying to fertilize two different audiences in the same field. And it's all you're getting is weeds at that point. Like, yeah. And then uh, Matt Noon says, if it matters, I'd rather see your thoughtful, your thoughtful reviews. Man, reading is hard. <laughs> I'd rather see your thoughtful reviews over a short any day, but I feel your frustration. Yeah. It's, it, it is, it is, oh yeah. And that's a lightsaber video. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. It, it, the, I have done, I've done things before where that used to work that now, you, like when I had 40 or 50,000 subscribers, I could mention a YouTube channel on Facebook, on my Facebook uh, retro blasting page. And suddenly that channel would get hit with like, 250 new subscribers in 36 hours. Like it was I need like, 250 new subscribers. I got to hit 2K. <laughs> but that's but that's the crazy part, right? Because so because now I have to remind myself that was the days before Instagram took off and when Twitter was still just 140 characters and nothing and when Snapchat and Tumblr and Vines were all dying and all that kind of stuff and so things weren't right. as things were more concentrated, right? So there was a lot more activity on Facebook. Zuckerberg hadn't pissed everybody off yet. And so like, yep. so people were still there, right? So now, even though I'm at 119,000 subscribers, I can shout out my friends and, and do and, and post links to their videos and stuff. And I'm like, did you get a bump? Did you get a bump? And they're like, I mean, I got maybe 50 more views. And I'm like, oh my God. Like the, the engagement has too. become so fragmented across yeah. all these portals. Yep. I mean, people on Instagram, for example, that only use Instagram, they're like, well, I don't really go to YouTube a lot. And I'm like, well, I that's kind of a problem because they make it really hard to post YouTube videos on Instagram. You kind of have to do yeah. Instagram videos. <laughs> yeah. And some people on Facebook, the few that still are there and only there are like, can you just do a Facebook video? And I'm like, no, I'm not wasting my time doing that. Like, you this know, this is going to Facebook too, but yeah. Well, no, that's great that you've learned how to simulcast because I am I am stupid and I have not figured that out. Um, I need to. We already established you're intelligent. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm the, look, I'm the dumbest person in the room when yeah. I walk in, I'm trying to learn from everybody else. Like really. Oh. My wife just called me. Oh, did you tell her you're still alive and you're in the garage? No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm going to FaceTime her and you can say hi to her. <laughs> yeah. Cause we're live. <laughs> Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, Hi. what are you doing? Nothing. I have some time on my phone, so I'm going. Okay, cool. Well, let me get done with this. Say hi to Michael. Hi. Hi, good to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> let me get off. I'll call you right back. Okay. Love you, bye. Sorry, I don't get to see her very often. No, I get it. She's away at Academy. Uh, gotcha. Cool, you got some good new videos coming up. Um, mm -hmm. You going to do another live stream anytime soon? Yeah, I'm hoping to. I'm trying to find the right topic. And people have been asking about War Stories. It is returning. War, war Stories was never canceled. It just kind of went yeah. on a break. So, yeah. 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 It's like me and Jeremy and the Joe's talking Joe. Like, he's PCSing and we got a million things going. You know, it's it's hard. It is. Mm -hmm. It's hard. 
yeah but, uh, but um yeah i've got i've got some live streams coming up um i've got this restoration video coming up tomorrow uh well it'll be friday for everybody tomorrow on patreon um yeah. and then um i've got this big indiana jones 5 video coming out which it's like I, I feel like I'm I feel like I'm using every round in the in the mag at this point on this one. It's like the, it's like the Butch and Sundance move at the end where I just bust out of the bar. Oh, yeah. hoping, just... I'm hoping that this breaks through the glass ceiling of the YouTube algorithm somehow. And and uh, it's a gamble. We'll see. So, well, I'm excited to see it. Uh, Johnny says, wish you guys could have made it out to PowerCon. Yeah, I, I wish I could have, too. But the, the army said no leave because I had already gone to Joe Fest and I'm retiring. So, hmm. But Michael, I cannot thank you enough for hanging out with me and uh, hanging out with everybody in the chat. And um, a lot of new faces in my chat, and I appreciate you guys coming here. And uh, if you like tonight's show, maybe poke around at some of my other videos. They're not all negative. <laughs> They're not all negative. Well, people should. People got to stop being afraid of negative. Like, just stop being afraid. Get in there and 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 dig around and and let yourself think. Yeah. Like, just watch some stuff and and let it reflect on you. Like, yeah. really. Yeah, I mean, because if something's crap, I'm just going to give my opinion as just an opinion, and yeah. I'll say it's crap. So but. Yeah. Cool, Michael. Thank you so very much, and um, hopefully I'll see you in the chat tomorrow when I'm hanging out on Analog Toys with Tony, uh, talking about right. is uh, 118 scale dead, which I say no. I will be there. Cool. Thank you very much. Sir. And thank you for everybody who's been hanging out with us in the chat. Uh, you guys are fantastic, and live YouTube would not be fun without the chat. So I, I can't thank you all enough. And remember, everybody, uh, toys should be fun. Mm -hmm. Michael, you got any uh, parting thoughts? No, just I I was so excited to to be chatting with you tonight. I was so excited. I was looking forward to it. And yeah, me too. I just got to tell you, it did it, it it met all my expectations and more. I've had such a great time. It's been relaxing. It's been a nice mental break from the monotony of the Indy Five Endless Edit. So I'm thank glad. you. Matthew Matson was here the whole time. <laughs> Lurking. Thanks, buddy. Well, Michael, again, thank you so very much. And um, I look forward to the next time we can hang out and talk toys and pop culture and whatever. Absolutely. Good thank you so very it. much. Everybody in the chat, thank you guys so much. And have an awesome night.